have uh, the most recent the system which has been made by uh, IBM and the uh, Siri, Alexa, and uh, the system which is um, or the self-driving cars. Uh, so these all are, are uh, intelligent systems what we have and even a system which is uh, which can um, uh, defeat the human brain uh, in chess and what how uh, how can we uh, what actually are the component of artificial intelligence so actually artificial intelligence is combined with machine learning where uh, that means ability of machine to learn uh, without explicit, uh, you know, you don't have to do extra programming. And then the deep learning where the information is in the layers and they are networked and they work exactly like uh, our uh, neurons. So they, they are like uh, what they call is neural network. So this is this all comprises of artificial intelligence. Um, there are three stages uh, people define the artificial intelligence stage one which is artificial narrow intelligence, which is uh, a weak uh, AI. There is no threat for mankind. And we just give a set of tasks, and then uh, narrow functions will be there. And then no thinking capability. Um, uh, there is no thinking is involved here. Then we have um, stage two, artificial uh, general intelligence, where it's a bit strong intelligence, and it is a threat to human being, as uh, said by Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, um, here the machine starts to think like human. And uh, it also starts taking decision like human. So that is that might be a um, danger for us. And then uh, the stage three is the artificial super intelligence. It's a super AI. Um, and uh, of course, when the computers or machines started thinking beyond us, or they, they um, they, uh, beyond, beyond human intelligence, that is called uh, uh, stage three or uh, ASI. And this is an artificial uh, si hypothetical situation, and I hope that we will not reach there. <laughs> um, now, how artificial intelligence can help material research, why it is required, uh, what does it work? Uh, how does it work for material discovery or material science? I would I would say, and uh, what are the advantages? So here I would like to introduce a term, Industry 4.0. Uh, you might have heard about this quite a lot. Uh, so AI is the key element of uh, which drives the Industry 4.0. So why we need into, uh, AI? Because we have a lot of data till now. What, especially in material science, why we need it? Because Till now, there were not so many materials, but now we have a lot of information out there um, regarding the material. And these materials, uh, so this big data needs processing, needs connectivity, mm -hmm. and um, uh, needs the information which end user can handle. So for th that's why that means we need to uh, converge the um, emerging technologies that means miniaturization, uh, integration of miniaturization with uh, uh, in, uh, uh, the, the technologies, and then compatibility with Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0, what it is actually, it is. Um, so if we see the uh, industrial revolution graph, we, um, we chart, we see that the first industrial revolution was mechanization. The second um, industrial re revolution was related with electrical energy. Third was related with uh, um, electro electronic and IT systems. And the fourth one is now for digitization. And digitization, that means we can really use artificial intelligence in this system very wisely. So we can, uh, what we need in industry 4.0 is cyber physical system. And uh, we have fast, we need faster automation. We have big data. So these data should connect and connectivity and, and user handling. So this kind of thing, again, I would say that is uh, very uh, good. Uh, we can use the artificial intelligence in these systems. Now, um, I, I read somewhere this term, this, uh, materials 4.0. Uh, this slide I made three years ago. And um, at that time, this was just an hypothetical term where we need to 
uh, if we need to uh, make the synthesis, for example, or we need to discover new material, then we need to have the multi-scale modeling, we need the machine learning algorithm, we need the virtual synthesis and characterization uh, system. Uh, so that means basically we need uh, AI for these materials 4.0. And now uh, in, you will see in the recent slide, uh, next slide that we have achieved in three years time, in very short time we achieved to this. So here are some examples where uh, artificial, uh, people have used artificial in the material discovery. Uh, the, uh, there is a computational um, uh, work by uh, Avery et al. Uh, published in, um, I think it's in um, NPJ Computational Materials. What they have done, they have uh, discovered 43 new system of carbon. And out of them, these three are the most hard, super hard carbon, harder than the diamond. So this, this kind of discovery was only possible through when they made some algorithm, they use the machine learning and they use the um, uh, artificial intelligence system for, for uh, these discoveries. So this is one example. Another example is, um, is at local level. That means at molecular level, how uh, people have, are using artificial intelligence. So there is um, a group by uh, Bartok. Uh, they published in 2017 at the time when I made the slide. Um, they published, um, just after that uh, in science advances and they, what they have they made, they have made a soap gap, the trained soap gap uh, algorithm, um, which is a, is a model based on the, uh, so what they have got, they have got the uh, data um, from the ab initio calculation, uh, molecular dy dynamic calculation, it's, it's for very small um, uh, scale, uh, that is, um, at three by three risk reconstruction as shown here. And uh, this was the reconstruction of silicon surface. And that was possible by this, um, by making this, uh, this trained soap gap uh, model. So what now when we can calculate theoretically. So what they have tried, they have tried to validate by artificial intelligence or by making the algorithm, this uh, soap uh, gap system. And now we can go in the lab and try to work on this. Similarly, they have uh, predicted in the same uh, paper, they have predicted the uh, stability of glucose conformer at di different level of theory. So uh, again, they tried to validate the theory by, the, uh, by this uh, trained soap gap um, system. Professor so Kerr? Uh, yeah, OK. You got a, a couple of minutes to wrap up. Okay, so uh, the, this is very interesting discovery made by the Delft group where they have very, very brittle system. It breaks like this and with the use of artificial in intelligence, with the use of, uh, use of machine learning, what they have tried to do, they have to try to make a super compre uh, compressible system. And this what they have done, they have tried to, they have mapped the data. So uh, by when, when the machine learning the, or computer was working, they tried to map the data and then they found a very stable system and they, then they 3D printed. So the thing what we can do in the lab for longer time by trial and error, they just did it in few, uh, a few days time to make the uh, super compressible system uh, and then simply printed it in few, uh, maybe few hours. So this is, how it is, it can be, this is how beautiful AI can be for us uh, as material scientists. And um, uh, again, for the synthesis, what they have done, uh, people have uh, um, uh, worked on that they made an artificial chemist. And this artificial chemist will um, collect the information from, for, about the colloidal quantum, quantum dot, uh, process the um, synthesis pathways, uh, and then finally, and in situ, they will do, during the process, they will do artificially measure the, uh, the properties, and then they will say that, okay, for this particular part, quantum dot, this particular pathway is good. So this is how it will be very time uh, saving for us. Uh, and our, uh, our, as material scientists, I would say that our, uh, our um, uh, research can, uh, can improve tremendously with this AI. 
what we have suggested again in that paper that we have suggested the map, conceptual map for the process of 4D printing from design to test to fabrication and uh, of the 4D printing part. But again, here, this is the conceptual design. Uh, the uh, right hand side, it is multi, um, multi uh, material system to, uh, optimized for a particular uh, requirement. But then these are the conceptual design, and now I think it would be good if we can integrate it with the AI. Uh, give this information and uh, develop it through the AI. Um, so I will just skip that, that uh, what we have done, we have uh, tried to, so uh, we have tried to make, uh, by our developed material, we have tried to make the nano actuator and um, by 3D and 4D printi printing um, technology. Till now, the system was, uh, the actuating system for uh, particularly um, material was only for micro and macro, but we are able to achieve at nano using stimuli responsive and shape responsive materials. Um, so what we have done, we have tried to biomimic the system. So uh, I will just skip that. We just check the biodegradability, biocompatibility, uh, and stimuli, stimuli responsive property, and then fi finally um, fabricate the molecular machines and uh, integrate it with the bio-inspired nano actuators. Um, the most important thing is that what we try to do, uh, try to make our uh, intelligent material or smart responsive material, we try to learn from the biological system, for example. In Proteas, you have the open um, uh, design, but with the, uh, when you have open a system, but when you have uh, the temperature or, or any other external stimuli, it gets, it, uh, you can close the system. And similar thing what we have tried to do, we have tried to use the external stimuli uh, from, to reach from amorphous to, um, uh, to uh, the crystallized system. Uh, in next two slides, I think uh, it will be there. Um, what we try to learn what we actually want is that if you see in the um, biology, we have DNA, RNA, and they are all interconnected. So it's a kind of artificial uh, intelligent system, or it's, it's a kind of intelligent system, not artificial, but natural intelligent system, that if we have, uh, we, if we see the size and scale at the at the level of in, uh, the information from RNA DNA can reach to tissue and organs, and we can uh, we uh, uh, a human being can be made. And similarly, if we can connect all our system, um, uh, uh, a chemical system, all the properties from nano to bulk, that would be really ideally ideal system. Um, and uh, but there are challenges. We have physical property uh, challenge. We have structural properties, dynamic properties. So what we can we do? So this is a question. Can we do? Can we change the uh, surface roughness in a surface roughness to layers or any property which can uh, which can integrate with other systems? So other system can sense this property and integrate with the system, and we can have the adoptive behavior. So if it is possible, I mean, we are trying to, but uh, still we need uh, a long way to go. So just Dr. in this Kareem, slide. We're Dr. Kareem, yes, we're yes. running out. Okay. Uh, this is the last system, uh, uh, last but one slide, and then I will uh, tell you exactly what we have done for the, um, uh, for the uh, artificial. You have to come to a conclusion, please. Thank you. Okay. So we have uh, made the, um, uh, the quantum uh, system of TiO2, which was not possible till now. Uh, we are able to make the quantum uh, dot of TiO2 uh, um, uh, within a supramolecular system. And then we, we are trying to use it um, for the, um, for the tissue, uh, tissue absorption. Um, and again, we learned the lesson from the, from the nature. We have also, by using surface functionality, we have developed this 3D printed nanoscale superhydrophobic system. And we use uh, the, the hypothesis what we have given in our publication. We are able to, that if we change the uh, uh, shape change or um, property change by the stimuli, we, are, we will uh, achieve 4D printing and we are able to achieve. So, 
the 4D printed system by for, so if we we have a this uh, we have a this a very well flat system when we have given the ex external stimuli we are able to achieve this system um, which is uh, very um, close to a um, a system uh, uh, and um, what you call the um, um, uh, 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 and uh, and um, uh, a natural uh, uh, this, uh, living system, which is called uh, water beer. And water beer is ha having a, a very ex uh, interesting property that it can survive in extremely cold and it can um, uh, survive in extremely hot weather. There is no oxygen. So if we can achieve this kind of system, so one part we have achieved, we have tried to actuate and we have tried to measure the uh, uh, measure the drug release system uh, release of this system and we are able to find that uh, this system is very interesting for local drug release um, i cannot give you more uh, i cannot uh, tell more in detail about this at the moment but yeah we are able to achieve by 4d print 3d 4d printing a nano actuator um, Okay. okay. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Varsha Kare, for thank this you. nice presentation. Thank and you, you really uh, <coughs> illuminated us uh, the, on the use of AI in material science. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm really I'm sorry kinda... for the overtime, but <laughs> no, no, it's it very happens. difficult. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so, our next speaker is Dr. Sobna Chaudhary. Uh, she has done a PhD from Jainarayan Bias University, Jodhpur. Uh, she has uh, she had got a serve fast track scheme for young scientists in 2013-16. Uh, he is a senior scientist uh, in the National Institute of Science, Communication and Information Resources, New Delhi, that is called NISKR. This is a CSIR uh, institute, and uh, her interest includes dielectric spectroscopy, condensed matter physics, polymer nanocomposites, solid polymer electrolytes, polar liquids. Uh, her citations are 1791 H index 26, I10 index 58. Uh, she is also editor of Indian Journal of Pure and Applied Physics. Applied Innovative Research. Uh, uh, today, she will be speaking uh, on advances in polymer nanocomposite and electrolytes. So now I invite Dr. Somna Chaudhary to uh, start her lecture. Please. Thanks a lot, sir. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Verma for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share my research experience on this platform. Uh, I have started my research journey in 2008 as a PhD student, and I worked for polymer nanocomposites. In my postdoc, I worked on electrolytes. And since 2016, uh, my main functional work is uh, editing of CSI and FCS journals. So besides uh, the editing of journals, I'm still continuing my uh, research work. So here, uh, I think the maximum audience is PhD students uh, uh, who are the beginner in the field. So I have uh, uh, designed this uh, PPT according to them. I'm going to give the brief introduction about my research work, which I have done in last one year. So I'm going to uh, think about advances in polymer nanocomposites and electrolytes. So now mm -hmm. I'm going to give brief introduction about polymer nanocomposites. In polymer nanocomposites, fillers that have at least one dimension, that uh, that means uh, that may be length, width, or thickness, uh, that should be in nanometer size range. And these are used as additives in polymer matrix so that the basic properties of polymer matrix can be altered according to our requirements and according to the uh, application of the PNC so that we can use them in different Things. Uh, I have worked on uh, several polymers, so here I am giving one example of a uh, polymethyl metal slide. In this slide, uh, here the uh, back uh, Here, PMMA, here I am uh, editing. Uh, 
here i am at uh, here i am adding uh, nano particles in polymer matrix so this type uh, there may be this type of formation of polymer nano particles second next sir so uh, excuse me uh, can you stay in one place and I speak because if we go back the sound is no, just go back sir just go back yeah so uh, several times we see that the individual polymer doesn't fulfill all the requirements. So blending is a very popular nowadays. We can blend polymers or we can blend the uh, nanoparticles also. So here I have blended two polymers, polyethylene oxide and polyethylene methyl liquid with the uh, nanofillers. Then this type of formation has occurred. So uh, the next please. I have used uh, various nanofillers in this slide. So there are three types of nanofillers. First is nanoparticles, whose diameter lies between the one nanometer to hundred nanometer. I have used SiO2, alumina, TiO2, SiO2, and zinc oxide. Here, second is nanofibers, whose diameter is also lies between one to hundred nanometer. I didn't work on nanofibers. I have worked on nanoplastics. In nanoplastics, I have used monosmerolite. As a nanofiller, whose thickness is uh, whose uh, thickness is of the order of nanometer, and that also lies between one to hundred nanometer. Next, please. So, in polymer nanocomposites, uh, we do uh, what we do. We just a nanofiller in the polymer matrix. So, what happens? So, in this slide, I have tried to picturize the thing. Then, I have added polymers in the clay shapes. So uh, MMT clay has platelet structure. There is a spacing between the platelets. So due to uh, swelling properties of the clay, there may be three types of uh, structures. First, the mat composite material may be intercalated type. That may be of exfoliated type, or there may be the formation of fractals. In intercalated uh, material, simply the polymer chain enters into the MMT gallery, and this type of structure forms. In exfoliated materials, the platelet structure of the clay is disordered and uh, this randomly distributed in the polymer matrix. So, in the toys, there uh, neither the polymer enters into the clay galleries nor uh, the, the platelet structure uh, destroys. Simply, the polymer is stuck outside the surface of the clay. Next, please. So now the applications of polymer nanocomposites. Uh, these are widely used in flexible electronic devices. Uh, they are used in cancer, energy generator, harvester, and storage materials. Ultraviolet and electromagnetic shielders, organoelectric devices, optoelectronic devices. Most matrices for solid state and conductive electrodes. My research work mainly focuses on the last thing. That is, I have used polymers for their application in solid state ions. I am conducting electrolytes. Next, sir. Next, please. So, uh, this was the brief introduction about the non, uh, polymer nanocomposites. Now, I uh, come to electrolytes. Electrolytes act as a medium for the movement of ions and commonly consist of solvent, uh, solvent and ionic ions. Two types of electrolytes are famous, liquid electrolytes and solid electrolytes. Nowadays, main focus of the researcher is on the solid electrolyte. So, electrolytes, uh, uh, the role of electrolyte in the lithium ion batteries is uh, to transport the ions from anode to cathode during charging and vice versa. So, next please. So, desirable properties of electrolytes. Uh, uh, they should be uh, low in cost. There should be high safety, they should be leakage free so that we can easily take the electrolytes from one place to another place. High electrochemical stability, safe working over high temperature range, and appropriate ionic conductivity and ambient temperature. So, that is the main thing that we can gather the ionic conductivity, and that should be uh, uh, of the order of 10 raised to power minus 5 Simon per centimeter. So, next please. Now I come to the uh, to my research that is solid state. I have worked on solid state electrolytes. Uh, transports of iron in solid state materials is facilitated by presence of any defect or disorder 
in the crystal structure of the solid so that uh, the ions can use this uh, disorderliness for their mobility for their movement through the material some examples of some ionic conducting materials uh, people have used are glasses polymer polymer blanks polymer nanocomposites i have worked on polymer polymer blanks and polymer nanocomposites next please why polymer electrolytes uh, this is very popular nowadays the main advantage of uh, these is uh, that it is of protection they are light in weight that ductility and some most common widely used polymer for electrolyte preparation is uh, polyethylene oxide polyethylene methacrylate poly electrolytrile and pvdr next please so uh, solid polymer electrolytes basically we add alkali metal salts mainly lithium based salts are used for the preparation of solid or polymer electrolytes with the suitable polymer matrix that can be an individual polymer or the blend of the polymer uh, advantages of uh, solid polymer electrolytes are high ion storage density they are compact in size they are lightweight they are leak proof uh, of course low price next key uh the applications of solid polymer electrolytes is in the high energy density factory electrochromic devices super capacitors fuel cells and sensor etc next thing the materials on which i have worked till late uh, i have used polymer as i have told earlier pu pmme pva pvc i have used three lithium salts uh, uh, lithium perchlorate lithium tetra fluoroborate and lithium triclate i have used inorganic uh, nanofiber as i have shown earlier i have used plasticizer also because in solid polymer electrolyte the flexibility of the solid polymer electrolyte is the main uh, requirement so what uh, the addition of plasticizer in fact they just are simply flexible uh, the thing and the they uh, faster the movement of polymer chain segmental dynamics i have used polymer solvent also for their preparation next please uh, so i here i am going to tell about uh, two polymers which are in detail uh, one is polyethylene oxide i have used polyethylene oxide this is the most popular polymer which is used in the preparation of solid polymer electrolytes for they are uh, used in lithium ion battery the main advantage of peo is its low lattice en uh, energy it's environment friendly its glass transition temperature is low uh, and it has sufficient electron donating uh, power of ether oxygen for coordination there with lithium with lithium cation uh, it has good solvating power for a large range of alkali metal salts and it uh, its ability to form highly flexible ties so in the right hand in the right hand side of the slide we can see the coordination of lithium ion with the ethylic oxygen of pu so this type of uh, interaction uh, occurs the main disadvantage of polyethylene oxide is its semi crystalline morphology which hinders the ion transport mechanism and results in the low ionic conductivity of the electrolyte for the high ionic conductivity the material should be amorphous so uh, second sir next so uh, polyethylene methacrylate which is a good uh, amorphous uh, polymer uh, it is highly amorphous that is up to 96% that is leading to higher ionic conductivity so it is also popular in the preparation of electrolytes it's a good outdoor weather ability and environmental stability uh, life uh, weight with good life expectancy high life transparency very less reactive to lithium electrodes so the electrolyte uh, light should be less reactive with the electrodes so that it can enhance the life of the battery and uh, it's a low cost of polymer the main disadvantage of this polymer is its brittle property it's a brittle in nature on the other hand we uh, uh, we uh, require uh, the flexible thing so it's a drawback of pma we are under a certain loaded force it limits its industrial and technological stability of only pmma based acid so in uh, polyethylene there are two possible electron donating functional groups but the acid i result suggests simply the uh, 
uh, carbonyl group uh, uh, 3110O is the only possible site from which the Arlington Island can coordinate. Next, sir. So, uh, because uh, each uh, polymer has some advantages, some disadvantages to uh, being a researcher, it's a um, new area that blending of polymers is becoming popular so that uh, we can uh, acquire the advantages of uh, individual polymer in uh, one metric. So, blending of PEO and PMMA has become a green chemistry, effective and economic way of suppressing undesired properties like in uh, PMMA. We, we can suppress uh, its brittle nature by blending it with uh, PEO. And on the other uh, on the other hand, PMMA environment increase the amorphous phase of the PEO, which is the main requirement uh, to enhance the ionic conductivity. Next, sir. So uh, uh, I am going to uh, I have prepared a solid polymer uh, electrolyte. Uh, I have taken. Uh, polyethylene oxide and polymethyl methyl plate and I have blended these two polymers and then I have mixed this with lithium and then nanopolar energy. So here the, uh, this type of uh, uh, complexes may be formed because lithium ion has four to six uh, types of coordination. So lithium ion can coordinate, uh, can make a bond with the structure. In complex first uh, uh, one, the lithium ion can coordinate with the uh, polymer chain. Uh, in second, we can see that uh, uh, lithium ion coordinating with the, the polymer chain and uh, as well as with the MMT clay. Uh, in complex 3, lithium ion is coordinating uh, and uh, attracting with the MMT clay. So, in a polymer, there may be this type of, uh, there may be formation of these type of complex. Next, sir. Next, sir. So, in this slide, we can see that, so before back. In this slide, uh, we can see that PEO PMMA cation coordinated MMT intercalated structure. The MMT calories provide the path to the cations to move in the uh, in the solid poly in this uh, time. This uh, transportation is more due to coping mechanism. Next, next. Uh, I have prepared the solid polymer. So back that is. Repeat yes. it. Is right. Yes. Uh, since processing methods and their conditions by preparation of PNCs and SPs affect the achievement of their desirable property, we can alter the property by using different types of techniques. Uh, we can use, I have used melt casting technique, I have used solution casting technique. Uh, I have given several uh, treatment to the uh, uh, while the preparation of solid polymer electrolytes for the enhancement of uh, uh, dispersion of a nanopolar in the polymer uh, matrix, I have used ultrasonic treated solution casting. I have given microwave irradiation treated solution casting. And I have used both ultrasonication and microwave treatment while the processing. Next, sir. Next. So, uh, in material science, uh, so that's it. In material sciences, uh, a researcher should be aware uh, that after processing the uh, material, uh, he should be aware he, what type of characterization he should perform. Actually, uh, on uh, which field he is focusing, so uh, the uh, uh, selection of characterization techniques is very necessary. My main focus was in uh, dielectric and electric characterization. I have used dielectric electrician spectroscopy. It is employed to measure the dielectric uh, properties of the composite materials as a function of frequency. Uh, it is basically based on the external AC electric field with the electric dipole moment of the sample. Often expressed by the permittivity, we calculate the permittivity by employing this dielectric electrician spectroscopy and manual and the data obtained can be used to calculate the AC conductivity of the material in different frequencies. Next. Uh, in this slide, I have shown that how I placed my material in the electrode and I have applied the AC signals and uh, by doing this, I am uh, collecting the data. And after the collection of data, next. Sir. 
I have evaluated some dielectric parameters like permittivity, electric law, uh, electrical conductivity. Next, please. Uh, the complex electric modular spectrum, impedance, uh, and uh, the last equation shows the mutual correlation among the various dielectric and electric functions. Next, please. Uh, I have uh, uh, the sigma prime value, that is AC conductivity of the metal was fitted to the Johnson power law to get the uh, to get the uh, DC ionic conductivity, and the log time delta uh, delta was uh, evaluated by uh, the ratio. Next thing. Uh, so here I am showing some of a uh, graph of my uh, work uh, which have been published in various journals. Here I am taking example of uh, one PVA PVD that is a blended with this Bradenol uh, nano filler. So in uh, in this uh, I have plotted sigma prime, sigma double prime, and tan delta uh, versus frequency. Uh, uh, here uh, this graph shows the variation of permittivity values with the frequency variation, and also there are uh, uh, we can see there is a variation uh, with the nano filler concentration. I have docked a different concentration of nanofiller in the polymer method. So this this shows the uh, uh, variation in the property. Next, sir. So for electrical characterization, I have performed the X-ray reflection study. Uh, these studies basically carried out to perform the formation of the material and its phase identification. Next, sir. Next. Next, so here I am showing uh, the SRD pattern of dragon on nano powder and PVA PVC x in dragon on polymer nano composite. Here we can see that dragon is a highly crystalline uh, uh, nano filler. You can see the peaks uh, of the uh, uh, different planes, uh, which is in the range of uh, 10 to 17 degree uh, range. And uh, PVA and PVC uh, blend has hollow peaks, but as we add the dragon uh, we can see there is a uh, presence of the ZNO peak, which shows that there is a dispersion of ZNO with the uh, polymer. And if uh, I have plotted uh, uh, the graph between the ZNO concentration to the peak intensity of uh, these materials, so uh, that obtained a linear graph that shows that there is a good homogeneity of the ZNO uh, based films. So, next please. So for morphological characterization, I have used SAM and PVA. Basically, SAM studies are performed to confirm the surface morphology of the PLC film and the homogeneity of the size distribution for the nanoparticle. And EDX characterization has spatial significance in regards to the analysis of sample purity and also the presence of dispersed nanoparticles in the polymer matrix. This gives all the information. Next, sir. Uh, I have shown the same images. This Zadden of structure has polarized structure. These are the same images of the nano composite which I have studied. Next, sir. Next. This is the ADCS which shows the uh, presence of different uh, peaks in the composite material. Next, sir. And uh, for optical characterization, I have uh, performed UVD spectra and optical and light analysis. Besides peak characterization, I have performed FPIR, uh, DSC thermograms, and uh, these things, and my uh, brush work. So, uh, here I am going to complete my uh, presentation. Uh, so, I just tried to give a brief introduction about my research area. Uh, thank you, sir, for this lecture. Thank you. I hope I have completed in time. I'm being an editor of a research journal. Here I invite the good uh, research uh, contribution from the participants, from the panelists in our journal, Indian Journal of Pure and Applied Physics. This is the SCI index journal. So I think I can give uh, this is our best place for, for our editors uh, to ask for a good contribution of uh, research in our journal. So thank you, sir. Once again, thanks, uh, Srinivasan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shorna Chaudhary for nice presentation and we all are highly benefited by your lecture.
डॉक्टर सेसा काइंडली चेंज द पीपीटी सोइंग वर्षा खरे पीपीटी यस दैट्स व्हाई शी इज ओपन शी हैज टू क्लोज क्लोजिंग द टैब विल रिमूव इट्स कंटेंट ओके सी डू यू वांट टू सेव द कॉल हाउ टू क्लोज अ नो वी हैव डन नो प्रॉब्लम थैंक यू ओके 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 okay who is the next speaker? our next speaker is professor ravindra dhar uh, who is professor and coordinator center of material science university of allahabad his interest he is a liquid crystal man of india uh, his citations is uh, 2183 and more h index 23 i10 index 70 he has published Uh, as many as 173 papers in international journal of repute today he will be topic talking about the characterization techniques of liquid crystal and very interesting uh, topic and our students and all faculty members will be highly benefited by your lecture sir so now i request you to start your lecture thank you dr sir Professor Dar, you are a presenter now. Yeah, I think you can see my video now. Sorry. So, Professor, who? Am I at boot or not? Um. Yeah. Can you closely keep? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So, very good afternoon to all of you, and uh, thanks to Professor Tikke Verma and Professor Sanjay Sudhakaran. are giving me opportunity to talk for you yeah it's very uh, mild so aap sab aap apne muh ke paas jo hai ise bandh lijiye kaan mein to acha hai isko aisa karu without microphone ke baat karu dekho kaisa aata hai okay yes problem coming to me i don't know yeah okay and uh, Yeah, Ah, uh, it is visible now. Right. But main concern is uh, my audio. No, it is also audible. It is audible now. So uh, thank you once again, Professor Verma. And as you told me earlier, that the basic audience groups are students, uh, mainly MSc students and research scholars. So I have to keep my presentation that level. I may not be very uh, useful for persons like Professor Kumarshan, Professor Sanjay Shivasto, and others. So, first, I tell you about something about liquid crystals. I think uh, many of you know. It is a phase common between liquid and crystals. So, it has some properties of liquids and some properties of solids. It has good properties like viscosity, conformation, etc., and it is partially ordered systems like uh, solids. And uh, this uh, dual property makes them very useful for uh, device application. Basically, a particular type of uh, molecules are required to produce liquid crystalline state. Uh, for example, the first picture is five uh, series. Second one is uh, instead of polystyrene, you can see a long molecule. The third one is the disc-like molecule. So, first two category uh, molecules belongs to rod-shaped molecules, and the third one are called disc-shaped molecules, and they give you the total. Thank you. 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 And uh, 
Professor Da, yes. we could not hear your voice very clearly. What we can, can do? I, I remove this, uh, my, this uh, system and then I can talk directly. Let's see what yeah, please is. go ahead. Uh, yeah. someone, someone has told me that there is some setting in the microphone that we can use. The... Yeah. How is now? Yeah, now it is better. You, uh, you start. Close to the computer we talk. Yeah. Okay. Is it better? Yeah. So these are the partially ordered systems. Yeah. And uh, there are different kind of ordering. For example, orientational ordering as well as positional ordering. So uh, the first kind of liquid crystal has been orientational ordering, whereas there are some other kind of liquid crystals where there are positional ordering as well as uh, for example, if you can see here, again, in this case, so these molecules are aligned in a particular direction, this is called orientational ordering, and then they are uh, located in different layers, this gives you the functional order. So, liquid crystals have many, many kind of uh, phases uh, there, they, are, they show many rich polymorphism, and uh, so in one kind, uh, there is only orientational ordering, they are called pneumatic crystalline phase, and then there are several phases where functional ordering also exists, and some other kind of uh, ordering, special kind of ordering exists. And based on that, there are different kind of uh, uh, phases. Uh, broadly speaking, one is pneumatic phase, which has only orientational ordering, there is no functional ordering, uh, this holistic phase is spiral analog of the magnetic phase, and then there are the phases, uh, like asymmetric phases, where positional ordering also exists along with the orientation ordering. And they have also several subclasses, like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and then A also various A, A1, A2, AD. So uh, in liquid crystalline phases, there are various kinds, 200 kind of phases uh, nowadays. Uh, I cannot uh, go in that detail. And then if you talk in terms of the degree of order, then you can see a crystal phase is most ordered system and the liquid phase is most disordered systems. In between, ismetic liquid crystalline phase is just below uh, crystal phase, then you have cholesteric and then magnetic and then isomorphic. Uh, as I told, liquid crystals have properties common to those of liquids as well as solids. So we need all kind of characterization techniques which are essential for the measurement uh, in liquids as well as in solids. So if we start from synthesis, we need IER, we need NMR, we need UV visual, and then when it comes to characterization, we need differential scanning calorimeter to see various phases and then uh, we need polarized light microscope to identify the textures of different materials. We need accelerated diffraction equipment equipment to see the layer spacing, molecular size and all these things. We need SEM, we need CHEM, we need AFM and more importantly we need dielectric spectroscopy to see the uh, characteristic properties of uh, these liquid crystalline materials to make them suitable for uh, application. We need viscometer for uh, the study of uh, liquid properties, we need refractometer, we need electro optical measurement, and many more. Uh, in short span of 30 minutes, I cannot uh, cover all these uh, techniques. I will try to cover three of them if possible. Thermodynamic characterization, polarized light microscope characterization, and dielectric spectroscopy. Well, uh, for uh, thermal analysis or thermal characterization, we have been using DTA, we have been using TTA, but 
of the present days uh, use a more ordered instrument and that is known as differential scanning can be made. It is called differential scanning calorimeter because uh, measure the difference of heat supplied to two ovens and uh, that is very accurate. So this is the accurate technique in comparison to DTA and heat. Basic components of the thermal analysis are sample holder, sensors to detect and measure the property of the sample and temperature and enclosure within which the experimental parameters may be controlled and then you need a computer, computer control system to acquire the data and for further process. These are the basic principles of the three different kind of thermal systems. In DTA, sample and reference are supplied heat for a single heater, whereas in the case of DSC, or compulsive DSC, they are supplied heat for separate heater and difference of the currents or power between the two heater. And in the case of heat flux DSC, uh, heat supplied them separately for a single block, so difference of the heat is measured. Sample holders are basically ammonium, but they can be some other material as well. It may be uh, silver, it may be copper, depending upon your need. And then there are sensors. These are the sensors. Physical sensors, furnaces are aluminum block containing sensors and differentials. And then temperature controller is also there. I will skip some of the slides because uh, I have to cover uh, all the three of them. So uh, this is a modern uh, differential scanning calorimeter. Here you can see this is the main unit where furnaces and uh, different uh, sample holders are inside. Uh, this is prepared sample. This is the processing system and there is somehow here is a refrigerator system. If you have to go below room temperature, this is nitrogen that is required for the pricing of the around the sample. Again, I will skip all these. Okay, so basically what happens in differential scanning calorimeter, uh, we have uh, two ovens. In one, a reference sample is, sample holder is kept, empty sample, sample holder is kept, and in the other one, uh, sample holder along with the sample is kept, and the heat, difference of the heat, even these two is uh, measured. So, what are the basic requirements to be done before actual measurements? Uh, before doing actual measurement, we keep empty sample holders in both the ovens and we run the DSC. And if there is uh, no sample, then there should not be any difference in the heat supplied to the system. And then if we plot heat, given to the system versus temperature, then there should be a horizontal line. This line is called baseline. And very important thing is that this baseline should be horizontal. If it is not horizontal, like you can see here on the top, then you will miss many, many information. So first thing that you have to set up this baseline horizontal. There are procedures in each and every instrument to make them horizontal. So this is first basic need. And then you need calibration of the DSC. Because the temperature recorded match with the standard uh, constant temperatures of some of the standard elements. And they may be indium, for example, you can see it melts at 156.6 degrees Celsius and it's melting enthalpy is 28.45 joule per gram. For tin, it is at 231.9. Aluminium, for aluminium, it is 60.0.4 uh, degrees Celsius. You may have inorganic uh, calibrants, you, have, you may have organic calibrants, and you need to calibrate properly your instrument according to the need of your temperature range. According to the need of the material enthalpy, 
at all age. You have to make the choice, proper choice. The best thing of the DSC is that very small sample is needed in the DSC. Only two to three milligram of the sample is needed in DSC for the study. And you can guess that two actually the sample is very small sample. Another important parameter is the scanning rate. With what rate you are heating the system? And then uh, you come to sample preparation. So for sample preparation, you need if when you are weighing two to three mg of the sample, you need very high quality of balance with very good accuracy. Most often we have the balance of the accuracy of one microgram so that you can uh, weigh 2.3 to 1 or something like that. So if you don't, if you are not able to manage uh, microgram accuracy, then at least you may have, you should have uh, 10 microgram, not uh, more than that. And while putting the material in the pan, it is important that this material is are only cover the bottom bottom of the uh, pan. Otherwise, heat flow will not be equal, and there will be several kind of errors. There are several other precautions. Uh, of course, you have to choose your pans according. If you have to go up to only 600 degrees Celsius or 550 degrees Celsius, aluminium will work. If you have to go at higher temperatures, then different kind of sample uh, holder pan will be needed. So how do you get? You get uh, this kind of thermograms. And this is, uh, you can see, this is a very broad peak. And the area under this peak is called enthalpy of the transition. Heat required to make transition from one phase to the other phase. So this is a very broad, very broad and very big peak. So this is a kind of identification that it is transition from one major phase to the other. In this case, it is shown melt of the uh, solid phase into the liquid crystalline phase. But then you can see here is a small uh, This is transition from a liquid crystalline phase to another liquid crystalline phase. And when we magnify this one, this one, you can see here, uh, here is another one uh, small peak. And if your baseline is not corrected properly, or if you your your vertical axis is not expanded, you will miss this kind of transition. That means important phase transition you will not be able to uh, locate on your DSC side thermograph. So it is very important that you uh, make the baseline setup properly. You calibrate it properly. Uh, even if baseline is not correct, for example, in this case you can see baseline is going down. So even after performing the experiment, you can uh, make the baseline horizontal, and then you make the analysis to get the proper result. I will skip further detail, otherwise I will not be able to cover several important things. You can see here another uh, uh, weak peak. Many of the workers had missed this peak, but when we did it, we found that no, there is a thermal. There is a peak you can see here. If you see at a glance, then you will miss this kind of uh, peak. But when we extended it, we found that this is of this nature, and we found that this kind of new trans phase transition from PGB A phase to PGB C star phase. And uh, other people who had uh, studied this transition missed on the FC, but we were uh, able to detect. Again, here you can see this peak. This peak is coupled with this one. So again, here another one peak is coupled with this peak. So this shows that there is two different kind of peaks. And then by proper analysis, you can separate these two peaks. And then you can see that there are two different kind of transitions which are merged uh, under this peak. Here also it is showing a different uh, transition from Here it is the polycrystallization uh, in the same material. 
so with the different scanning rates okay, different scanning rate means uh, your reading uh, rate or polling rates are you can read uh, read the, uh, the rate of 2 degree celsius per minute you can read at the rate of 10 degree celsius per minute or 2 degree celsius per minute so by optimizing the scanning rate you can uh, bifurcate these kind of states this is another important uh, uh, thing that i want to discuss uh, in the fundamental analysis the time is restricting me to discuss this kind of thing but if you can understand then you try to think uh, about uh, uh, the process of thermal equilibrium and cause specific processes uh, if we determine the transition temperatures under the condition of uh, thermal equilibrium only then, then that kind of transition is the equal to so perfect transition but most often if we try to establish thermal equilibrium then how can our system move how can we change the temperature so that is why you uh, read in uh, graduate classes that we choose midway path like quasi static process so when we give slow scanning rate then what happens that this is the heating constant temperatures that we get from the sc that is at slightly at higher temperature than actually what it should be and as we increase the transition temperature this difference increases so you can see uh, we have obtained transition temperatures at different scanning rate and then it is increasing 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 with the fast uh, shift and we get reverse kind of things in the uh, cooling and we found that this behavior is linear and if we make a linear plot and extrapolate this curve to 0 degree celsius per minute that means this is transition temperature obtained at the in the condition of thermal equilibrium at the scan rate of 0 degree celsius which is experimentally not possible but you can extrapolate these uh, results and then you can see that transition temperatures obtained in the heating cycle and cooling cycles match together provided this transition is an anisotropic and anisotropic means uh, this transition occurs at the same temperature in both in the heating and cooling cycle there are many many transitions which do not occur uh, at the uh, same transition they are called monotropic transitions for example here this is monotropic but this is anisotropic and you can see uh, that they are matching at zero degree celsius per minute so this is the kind of important technique that we have developed to obtain uh, transition temperature under the uh, virtual thermodynamic equilibrium condition by extrapolating these results so this is very important so now with dsc in the case of liquid crystals uh, we can identify that okay at this transition temperature material is going from one phase to other phase but uh, it is not possible to identify what kind of phases are there so for that purpose either use xrd or any other technique but the simplest technique is in the case of liquid crystals to use polarized light microscope what is polarized light microscope you know uh, light is electromagnetic wave and if you use the polarizer you can make the polarization in a particular direction and if you use another analyzer and if they are cast you can stop the passage of the light if both the uh, analyzer and polarizer are silent then light will pass but if they are in cross position light will not pass this is the principle of the polarized light microscope and this is the picture here is polarizer and here is analyzer in between we keep the liquid crystalline material and when uh, uh, light polarized light passes through the liquid crystalline material this liquid crystalline material again rotates the uh, plane of the polarization of the light uh, at different places in different direction according to the kind of effect present in the material and then we get a very specific optical textures which are the characteristic of the liquid crystalline phases for example if you have a material showing the pneumatic phase this 
floor brush structure is the clear indication that it is pneumatic phase. So as soon as we get this kind of uh, texture, we say that okay, whatever transition we have of, uh, seen from the uh, differential scanning parameter, uh, this is uh, say uh, solid to pneumatic phase. And then for uh, this is this is pneumatic phase. And if it is ordered system or ordered system, some symmetric uh, phase, then this kind of Focal, focal conic texture that is observed, and if it, it is observed, then we say that okay, this is some kind of layer distance. In between the cholestic and uh, liquid phase, there exists a, a unique kind of phase that is called the blue phase, and this is the optical texture of blue phase. Uh, they are called frustrated phases. Similarly, this is a typical. Uh, Texture of PGB A phase, which is another frustrated phase, and as soon as we get uh, the textures, we characterize them to a particular phase. But most often, we are not lucky enough to get this kind of standard optical texture, and then make it your special expertise to analyze by optical textures as well as by some accessory. Uh, Additional characterization types like the uh, XRD, CHEM, CHEM, required what kind of phase is existing there uh, that you have observed in that uh, There are other techniques also by which you can determine uh, various transitions. For example, here we have determined it by measurement of magnetic constant, but I will skip here. In general, under differential scanning calorimeter, we should get a symmetric peak. But this is not always uh, the case. Most of the time, peaks are asymmetric. So sometimes it may be extending in this uh, side, on this side, may be extending on this side. So there are various kinds of things, and there are various associated phenomena also. With these peaks, and you will have uh, a uh, expert will need very expert knowledge to analyze these kind of uh, peaks uh, to find that what is happening there. In this case, for example, you can see there is endothermic as well as exothermic peak. In this case, there is broad peak and then there is sharp peak. Here it is uh, 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 asymmetric peak. Associated with a uh, small uh, peak. So, if you have broad knowledge of the uh, PSC characterization, okay, then you can tell that what is happening there. You can guess it. Then there are materials which show glass transitions. And glass transitions are something like this. There are Glass transitions associated with some uh, enthalpy also, and uh, then trans phase transition. So you will have to uh, be very careful to distinguish between the kind of surface phase transition and glass transitions, and only then you can distinguish between the parties. Okay, this is another kind of piece. Uh, so this is this is simply a. Uh, It is indium, and you can see that this peak is also asymmetric. If it is not symmetric, so uh, again, uh, you have to analyze why this kind of thing is happening. Another important parameter that you can determine with the PSC uh, is the heat capacity. I missed to tell you that you can determine uh, transition temperatures, transition enthalpy. Transition enthalpy means area under the peak that gives you the total heat involved in the transition. And then you can uh, find heat capacity as well. I told you earlier that if there are blank uh, sample holders in both the 
ovens then you will get a horizontal kind of base line but if there is a empty sample pan in one oven and another one is a sample pan with the material then if material has some specific heat so it will require additional cp into dc or cv into dc according to the situation which under what condition you are studying and then in that case now this baseline will not be horizontal it will have some kind of uh, positive slope and just by determining that uh, slope you can determine the specific heat of the material so you can determine transition temperature you can determine transition enthalpy you can determine specific heat of the material of different phases you can determine transition entropy also because transition entropy is nothing but the transition enthalpy divided by the transition temperature so these are the parameters that you can determine with the help of dsc and uh, preliminary if you have some idea about the transition enthalpy you can guess that what kind of transition is occurring for example it is very clear that if you have a melt process from solid phase to liquid phase then it will have been huge amount of but in the case of the meso phase transition for example say synaptic phase to mimetic phase you will have very uh, small transition and maybe uh, one tenth or even smaller of transition from crystal to then we have uh, derivative thermogranularity you can determine the mass loss and all these things i will also skip uh, i will skip this uh, thing also because i have to cover the dielectric spectroscopy uh, this is very important that there are uh, several kind of artifacts on your dc thermogram and uh, you have to be very careful for example if you have some kind of uh, Light fluctuation. There is some spark in the room. Then that will give you the this kind of artifact, and this shows that it is electrical effect or power spike etc. Near your DC system. Then uh, uh, you can see sometimes we get this kind of spike, and this is mechanical shock. Sometimes if uh, you just uh, somehow. Crash your table on this DC unit is kept, then you get this kind of uh, spike, and you should not confuse it with some kind of transition. So this is this was the sample toppers of the pan. This is room temperature change. This is first of uh, pan lid. This is intermittent closing of the holes in pan lid and all these things. So they are. are different kind of uh, artifacts and you must recognize them sometimes we could explain them with a kind of different kind of language so in the case of thermal analysis the uh, best thing is that it needs very small sample size and the best practice that you require is good thermal contact contact is needed between the sample and uh, pan and again pan and oven so all the time you should keep them very neat and clean so are only clean before you start your experiment you need proper sample capsulation different kind of uh, pan holders are available for solid material for liquid material uh, for materials which may be prized and then uh, it is also important to start your dsc from at least 10 to 20 degrees celsius below uh, the temperatures from where you are putting the constant temperatures and sometimes slow scan rates are good sometimes high scan rates are good this needs a lot of experience to optimize your scanning rate of the system calibration is another important aspect every two months three months uh, you should calibrate your dc system otherwise you will not get the proper result 
you must use proper flow of uh, nitrogen or helium gas to remove the uh, impurities mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and also avoid the composition of the sample in DSP, otherwise your uh, oven will be spoiled. Now, I am coming to the impedance spectroscopy and uh, there was some glimpse in the previous lecture. Uh, this is something very important to me because many times I have, I have seen that there are a lot of problems in the explanation of the results. Mm -hmm. So I tell you what is impedance spectroscopy. Uh, in graduate classes, you learn about the impedance. Impedance of the uh, a system is a resistive component plus reactive component. Reactive component may be capacitance and inductor, inductance, or either of them. If this is uh, capacitive reactance, then X is equal to 1 upon J omega C. And if it is inductive reactance, then this is J omega L. L is the inductance and C is the capacitance. Omega is equal to 2 pi F. F is the frequency of the AC by which you are measuring uh, capacitance. Are impedance. Professor Dur, yes. Can you please wind up in five minutes? Oh, right. Then after skipping so many slides, okay, five minutes. So R is equal to one upon T. Uh, means uh, it is uh, resistance is nothing but one upon conductance. And then uh, uh, if it X is composed of only one upon J omega C, then uh, if uh, uh, you just C and C0, then you find the complex permittivity you have seen in the previous lecture. And this complex permittivity is equal to uh, epsilon prime minus G epsilon double prime. This epsilon prime is known as uh, permittivity and epsilon double prime is known as uh, mass. I tell you here again, earlier people used to call it dialectic constant, but now people working in this area have objection that it should not be called dialectic constant because this uh, parameter is neither constant with the temperature nor the frequency, then why it should be called the electric constant? So better name is permittivity. So this is complex permittivity and this is uh, permittivity and this is mass. And these two parameters, three parameters are the function of frequency as well as temperature. When we want to study some material, we fill the material in the parallel plate capacitor or maybe different kind of uh, capacitor, but measuring the uh, impedance of that system is not very easy. Most often several parasitic elements are associated with those uh, uh, device under test and you can see these kind of valence circuits are formed. This is, this is uh, a device under test, a test and these are the parasitic elements. Uh, we have prepared a valence circuit model like this. Special, and then this is undesired capacitance by the connecting wires, and this is uh, this is uh, the conductance involved by the resistance of the electrodes. So this is not very easy to uh, measure the capacitance at different frequencies, and you need again very short uh, kind of uh, knowledge. And uh, you see here. High frequency region, these are the components of your capacitance, but these are the parasitic elements, which is inductance of the connecting wires, which is inductance of, and this is the resistance of the connecting wires. And because of that, uh, instead of getting constant, then you get this kind of uh, curve, and then you separate these kind of things uh, like this, and then you get, get the real result. And you can see. In this case, we should get a constant essence like this, this, but because of the parasitic element in the low frequency region, we get actual value like this. Uh, so these are the problems that we get. I think I will have to skip soon all these things. Uh, and here you can see we have removed this kind of artifact and we have found the real uh, uh, curve presenting the material, which is a good plot. Again, for a good plot, I tell you another very important thing that not written in the book, but when you plot whole coal plot, then the different axis 
means horizontal axis and uh, vertical axis must have uh, same scale. Otherwise, you will not get uh, this uh, circular arc. This we see many of the papers. Uh, I have seen in the previous lecture also. Uh, so you can see here. In the high frequency region, we have this problem. In the low frequency region, you know, we have uh, low, uh, low frequency parasitic effects, and therefore we are not able to get, uh, see the two different kind of uh, modes. Um, which are realistic mode of the material. So we need analysis. I will tell you how can we do this other analysis time. Of course, you can see that with the determination of R in jet, you can determine the collection fee because R is equal to rho into L of R A. So if you know rho, you can determine uh, sigma also. So that is another important parameter that you can determine here. And you see this is taking this uh, lecture. And then there are the liquid crystal, it is very good thing is that you have a different kind of mechanism in the liquid crystal because of the solid order phase and as well as the liquid phase. And there are various kind of modes. I, I don't have time to tell about these modes. There are more stone modes, there are soft modes, there are modes with rotation around the line axis of the molecule, and there are rotation around the line axis of the molecule. So this is very rich in uh, delicate microscopy. And, uh, You can see this is known as pole pole uh, equation, and this pole pole equation is added with a different kind of parasitic elements, which is low frequency uh, uh, term, and then there is high frequency term. And by uh, applying this formula, we fit the dielectric data to this equation, and then we remove different kind of, kind of parasitic elements. And now you can see a beautiful curve symmetric around the frequency and this is a real term, but this is not possible the, without including low frequency and high frequency parasitic elements. So uh, very important dialectoscopy is that uh, there is a parameter like uh, last factor uh, time delta I guess I will finish with it in a minute. Uh, uh, that is known as time delta is equal to the time of prime upon epsilon prime. There is a restriction that this value can never be above the one. If you are getting tan delta equal to uh, greater than one, then that means there are parasitic elements in the electric data. Uh, fortunately, what we have seen in the previous section, that tan delta was around 0.3 or 0.4. So that was very good, very, very carefully taken uh, data. But in most of the papers, you see that there is no need to put tan delta more than one. So that is clear signature that your data is. Uh, Sir, can you conclude this? Okay, it is finished almost. Okay. So uh, it is important that whether it is GSE or R is benefit frequency in both the cases, you will have to review, remove the artifacts. You must have the proper uh, experience to analyze them, to remove those artifacts, artifacts to get the real property of your material. So in fact, uh, all these techniques need one or two hours to discuss and it is very quickly discussed. I don't know how much you have been able to grasp it, but okay, these are the things. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dar, for very informative lecture. Uh, I sincerely hope that our students and all participants must be benefited uh, by this uh, lecture. So again, I extend my warm thanks to you. Thank you very now, much. Now, our next speaker is Professor R. K. Sukla, Professor, Department of Physics, University of Lucknow. Uh, he is having citations 1908, H index 20, I10 index 2, 52. Uh, he has published uh, over 100 papers, uh, filed two patents, and he has handled five projects so far. And today, he is going to tell about synthesis of conducting polyaniline 
metal doping and its application and i hope we will be benefited by his lecture so now i request professor r k sukla to start his lecture thank you okay uh, greeting to all panelists and attendees one minute i Yeah, you see my screen or not? Uh, we'll uh, yeah. Yeah, it is visible. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, firstly, I like to thank Professor K K Verma, Professor C S Sirvasan, and other members of the organizing team for inviting me to share my work on the virtual platform. Topic of my today talk is synthesis of conducting polyenolin. Sir, can you put your slide mode? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, synthesis of conducting polyenolin metal doping and its application. Here I will discuss about humidity sensing. The outline. The outline of my talk is introduction, electro deposition, and characterization of pristine polyenolin and doping of ZNO, MnO2, graphene oxide, Bi2O3, and then humidity sensing of pristine and doped polyenolin, and then conclusion. Uh, Hermann Sondinger proposed the concept of macromolecule in 1920 and got Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1950. for his discoveries in the field of macromolecular chemistry and the first conducting polymer synthesized by polystyrene by Hideki Sekawa Alan Heger and Alan McDermott in 1974 and they got Nobel prize in chemistry in year 2000 for the discovery and development of conducting polymer a polymer may be defined as long chain molecule produced by repeated joining of small units known as monomers by covalent bonds polymer may be natural polymer synthetic polymer organic polymer and inorganic polymer and natural polymers are amber rubber cellulose etc and synthesis polymer are polyethylene poly Strain synthetic rubber etc. And the organic polymers are those polymers whose backbone chain is essentially made of carbon atoms. Is term as organic polymers. For example, cellulose, protein, polyethylene, and nylon are known as the organic polymers. And those polymers which does not have carbon atom in their chain is term as inorganic polymers. for example glass silicon rubber etc the structure of polymer is different when the molecules are arranged in linearly then it is called linear structure of polymer and the property of these linear polymers are high density and high density polyethylene pvc nylon cotton are the example of linear polymer and branch uh, uh, polymers are those polymers which have some additional branches is there and the property of these branches uh, polymers are low density lower tensile strength lower melting point for example polyethylene and the cross linked and network structure of polymers they are hard rigid brittle and for example bakelite formaldehyde resin malamine calver epoxy are the cross link or network type generally organic polymers are insulator but group of some polymers are electrically conducting they are called as conducting polymers the property of these conducting polymers are they have single and double bond alternately known as conjugative bonds the conducting polymers are basically two types one is intrinsically conducting polymer and in this intrinsically conducting polymers have two types conducting polymers and doped conducting polymers and in this the polymer contain conjugated pi electrons in the backbone and in extrinsically conducting polymer we can add some uh, conducting part in uh, uh, polymers which are not conducting 
द फर्स्ट कंडीशन इज डेट द पॉलीमर शुड कंसिस्ट ऑफ अल्टरनेटिंग सिंगल बॉन्ड डबल बॉन्ड सिंगल बॉन्ड डेन डबल बॉन्ड दीज बॉन्ड ऑन नोन एज कॉन्जुकेटेड डबल बॉन्ड एवरी बॉन्ड कंटेन ए लोकलाइज सिग्मा बॉन्ड एंड दिस बॉन्ड इज स्ट्रॉन्ग केमिकल बॉन्ड एंड दिस पाई बॉन्ड इज वीकर एंड दिस पाई बॉन्ड इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द इलेक्ट्रॉन कंडक्टिंग इन द बैक बोन ऑफ द पॉलीमर द कन्वर्जन ऑफ पॉलीमर बैक बोन टू ए चार्ज पाई कॉन्जुगेटेड सिस्टम इज द इफेक्ट ऑफ डोपिंग देर आर डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ डोपिंग रिडॉक्स डोपिंग मीन्स रिडक्शन एंड ऑक्सीडेशन टाइप डोपिंग नॉन रिडॉक्स डोपिंग फोटो डोपिंग फोटो डोपिंग मीन्स इन द प्रेजेंस ऑफ लाइट charge injection doping means some charges are introduced in the polymer and electrochemical doping we are discuss about the electrochemical doping in this talk and there are different type of doping agents uh, these are neutral dopants uh, iodine bromine arsenic difluoride uh, sodium potassium sulfuric acid and ferric chloride and some are ionic dopants lithium percolate iron perchlorate chlorate sodium trifluoromethylene sulfonate and the, the organic dopants are trifluoroacetic acetic acid sodium trifluoromethane sulfonate and this is p-toluene sulfonic acid and this is polymeric dopants known as pbs and pbs PBS means polyphenyl vinyl sulfide and PPS is polyphenylene sulfide. Doped conducting polymers are of two types. P type means oxidative doping and N type this is reduction doping. P type doping is done by oxidation process. Oxidation process means removal of electrons from the polymer pi backbone electrons. And this formation is known as polaron. and polaron is responsible for the conductivity in the p type uh, polymers uh, doping with a lewis acid causes p type doping we take polymer and we react with lewis acid and we get the p type polymers and here i i to give this to uh, take electron from this acetylene to get and n time doping is a type of reduction process means addition of an electron to the polymer in p type doping we withdraw the electron and in n type doping we add the electron in the polymer and it forms polaron and bipolaron this is followed by recombination of uh, radical yields two negative charges carrier on each chain of polyacetylene the doping with a lewis base and p type doping we take lewis acid and here in n type doping we take lewis base a electron rich species result in n type doping here the this is lewis base sodium ethylide and it gives electron to the polyacetylene here uh, and extrinsically conducting polymer it is of two types conducting element filled polymers means some conducting polymers are added to the non conducting polymers we get uh, conducting polymers such as carbon black metallic fibers metallic oxide and carbon black is generally used because it has a very high surface area 1000 meter square per gram and more porosity it bears good conducting properties is low in cost light in weight as well as it is durable and blended conducting polymers means one polymer is added which is conducting and the whole polymers are becomes conducting means two polymers are added one is non conducting and other is conducting and the mixture is known as blended conducting polymers uh, some example of conducting polymers are polyacetylene polypyrrol polythiophene pe dot polyaniline and in this talk we take polyaniline because polyaniline has many properties 
is in all example of these conducting polymers we see that there are single double single double alternate single double and single double bond are exist so these are conducting polymers and those uh, compound or molecules have single or double bonds like this alternate these are conducting the example of conducting polymers are many it is used as light weight batteries now e vehicle is uh, launch and the, the main problem is uh, electronic vehicle is the battery because the battery weight is very high now we uh, in the current uh, lithium uh, battery is used the weight of lithium battery is very uh, bulky and high so we can use conducting polymers use as a battery and the battery of conducting polymers is lightweight and it is used as a super capacitor electrochromic devices electrochromic means we apply electric field the color is changing the polymelene is changing color when we apply different voltages and photoelectric cell or solar cell uh, bio sensors light emitting diodes switchable membranes anti corrosive coating on metal magnetic shielding flat panel display used in artificial intelligent materials and in place of pcb we use conducting polymer because conducting polymer is very uh, lightweight and non corrosive and in optical filter we use as a screen of tv mobile and laptop so there are many application of these conducting polymers and these are some picture of using conducting polymers and the conducting polymers is foldable so we can uh, fold the uh, polymers like this why we are taking polyethylene one of the most attracting uh, conjugated polymer in both non conducting as well as conducting form means polyethylene have both type of character conducting behavior and non conducting behavior let us see in uh, uh, other slide it can be prepared via polymerization using chemical oxidative or electrochemical method pani is uh, redox active pani means the salt form of polyethylene is redox active electronically conducting and can be used as electrodes for conductivity measurement these are the three structure of uh, polyethylene and this is permethylene emeraldine and lycomeridine and emeraldine uh, is of two types in emeraldine salt form and emeraldine base form and emeraldine uh, salt form is conducting and rest form is non conducting this is the uh, general formula structure of polyethylene here we have nh group and n group means if there are no n group then this is known as the transparent lycoemeraldine form and it is colorless and it is uh, insulator and when we dope it by ions then we get the blue emeraldine base and green emeraldine salt and when we up up get the emeraldine salt to base and base to salt by different percent of doping and we get the emeraldine base to pernigliline and green emeraldine the color of emeraldine salt is green color and the emeraldine base color is blue and pernigliline base is violet color and the pernigliline salt is dark blue color so color is changing due to these processes so we use this color changing property using uh, electrochromic devices uh, it has three form lycoemeridine and it is fully reduced form emeridine half oxidized and half uh, reduced and when it is fully oxidized then we get the pernigliline emeridine base form is highly stable at room temperature so it is regarded as the most useful form this form is neutral means non conducting and it 
dope state that is protonated it is called emeridine salt and emeridine salt is the conducting and its conductivity is 10 to the power minus 4 siemens per meter emeridine base form has equal number of imine and amine sites and protonation occur at imine site to form emeridine salt and gives bipolar or dicta Apart from oxidation level, polyenolene forms have also recognized by color and conductivity barriers. Means conductor to non-conductor and colorless to different colors. Polyenolene is obtained by a polymerization of aniline. We use the aniline as the starting monomer through chemical oxidation and electrochemical method. This is the uh, process of uh, chemical oxidation. And we use in this, the oxidant is APS, means ammonium persulfate. And this is uh, exothermic reaction. So we uh, do reaction in the ice temperature. And in electrochemical polymerization, Pani has been synthesized by anodic oxidation of aniline monomer through an inert electrode. One of the key advantage of the electrochemical method is that this technique allows direct deposition of polyenolene onto the conducting electrodes in a simple and cost-effective manner. Electropolymerization of polyenolene can be categorized into three types. Potential and uh, static means potential is constant. And galvanostatic means current is uh, constant. And potential dynamics means potential is very. This is the synthesis of polyenolene by using electrochemical. This is the potential set setup. And first we take aniline in 0.15 molar in deionized water and H2SO4 uh, is also 0.15 molar. And we mix these two in a, this mixture and we put this, uh, this is known as the electrolyte. And we put it in the, uh, uh, compartment, three electrode compartment, and here this is the uh, anode, and it, this anode is the ITO, and this is the cathode, and this cathode is the platinum mesh, and this is the reference electrode, and here reference electrode is the AG, AGCL, and we get the film on this anode here, and when we dot it, so we Again, use this to sample uh, solution, and we add um, doped solution in this. We get the doped film on the electrode. Uh, the electrochemical method is an easier method for mass production, and film thickness can be controlled in this method. And in uh, oxidation uh, method, we are not controlling the film thickness. The electrode division was carried out in one compartment, three electrode. The ITO glass has resistance 40 ohm per centimeter square with surface area 2 into 3 centimeter square and used as a working electrode. There are three type of electrode, working electrode, counter electrode and reference electrode. And palladium is used as counter electrode and AG, AGCL electrode is used as the reference electrode for deposition of polyenolene film. The polyenolene film by deposited in ITO coated glass. And these are the uh, properties of metal used as a dopant in this polyenolene. And uh, characterization techniques are used, X-ray diffraction, field emission, scanning electron microscope, optical absorption, and in optical absorption, we get the uh, band gap using tau plot, and for the PL spectroscopy, electrochemical properties, and humidity sensing. This is the experimental setup for humidity sensing. Here we take a chamber, <laughs> airtight chamber, and we put the film here, and the impedance is measured using the LCR meter. This is a standard hygrometer and after deposing the metal film, we make a metal contact on the film using silver paste or gold by sputtering. And we uh, control the humidity in this chamber by using these chemicals compound. 
If we take the relative humidity of 20%, then we use the CH3COMA. And when we <coughs> relative humidity is 40 percent then we use K2CO3 and 60 KI 80 percent RS to NaCl and 90 percent to K2SO4 and we change this for getting the required humidity in this chamber. Uh, the characteristics of sensor is uh, uh, the sensor is sensitive selectivity uh, reproducibility response and recovery time cost effective reliability uh, broad range of measurement durability interchangeability ability is must for any sensor um, in the uh, xrd of uh, polyenylene and this is pristine polyenylene or pure polyenylene and this is the xrd of zno in the pristine polyenylene we get the two peaks at 19.47 2 theta equal to 19.47 and 25.9 degree uh, this is the pure polyenylene and when we dope the zno by one weight percent two weight percent and five weight percent we see that the uh, <coughs> uh, second peak 25.19 peak is shifted to the right side on all samples and some new peaks also visible when we dope the ZNO in higher percentage. And the uh, 19.47 and 25.19 is correspond to the 100 and 110 plane. And these are other planes visible. Uh, this is uh, we see that the uh, uh, we calculate FWHM D spacing and crystallized size of pure uh, polyenylene and ZNO dope by using the Scherer formula. Here we see that the FSM of pure polyenylene uh, thin film have fibrous structure interconnected with each other on the surface. <coughs> This is 40k and this is 100k magnification. And we, when we dope to 1% ZNO in polyenylene, uh, the introduction of ZNO in polyenylene rod like structure grown on granular surface with occasional flower like structure visible. With increased percentage of ZNO, 2% aerial density of flower increases. In the last figure we get only one flower but in here we get one, two, three, four, five, six flower. Any more flower are observed when we dope in uh, higher percentage of ZNO. And this is UV visible spectroscopy. Here we uh, observe three absorption peak at 341 420 and 8 to 8 nanometer. The 341 nanometer is ascribed to pi pi star band transistor or benzoid unit in the polymer chain and this is the uh, imaging base form of the polyenylene. And 420 nanometer is associated with pi polaron transition which is generally observed in imaging base form of polyenylene. And this peak is due to the polaron pi, band, pi star band transition. And this is denoted as imidine salt form of polyenylene. And the band gap calculated by using tau plot, we get the band gap decreases as we increase the uh, per, uh, weight percent of ZNO. This is the photoluminescence spectroscopy and we get spectrum in visible and uh, visible region. In the UV region, we get 356 nanometer, 372, 395 for pure polyenylene. <coughs> and in visible region, 422, 447, 460, 483 nanometer are observed. And when we dope this, ZNO uh, in this film, the all peak intensities are reduced. 
and at 1 and 2 degree B and C curve for 1 and 2 percent intensity of all peak decreases and the peak obtained at 3, 9, uh, 95 nanometer disappear and the uh, peak at 460 of pristine uh, polymelane become broad for 1 percent and 2 percent. And this is the electrochemical properties of cyclo, uh, cyclic voltammetry. Here we uh, taking the uh, potential range of 0 0.2 to 0 0.8, minus 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 with respect to AG, AGCL, reference electrode. And the scan rate is 0 0.05 volt per second at 1 milliampere current. And we observe three peaks, A, B, C. And uh, we repeated this for four times. The first oxidation peak uh, A appear at 0.19 volt, which is due to the transition of leucoemaldehyde to polynanic emaldehyde form. And in the second oxidation peak at C appear at 0.75 volt, correspond to ferradic transition emaldehyde base to permeglin base. Here we see that the uh, area of this increases as we dope the genome. Uh, Professor, uh, yes. Uh, can you wrap it up? Okay, okay. Okay. The chronoembryometric study was carried out in order to investigate the current conduction properties of polynelin and Jadano for uh, 1200 second deposition time and a constant applied voltage of 1 volt. Here initially the, at the 50 second the current is decreases. After that the current is increases. The increasing current represents the uh, deposition of polyneline on the substrate. And this is the band gap of uh, polyneline. This is the summary. And this is the another dot of MNA2. Here we uh, same uh, curve uh, observed in pure polyneline, but in uh, MNO2 some extra peak appear. And this is the serial formula is used. And this is uh, here we see that the uh, formation of bunch with granules and white distribution throughout the dot film. At higher magnification, uh, cauliflower-like structure appear. This is a cauliflower-like structure appear. And in, in JNO case, we are not observed this side. And this is the uh, UV visual spectrometer. Here we also see that the band gap uh, is decreasing as we increase the dopant. And this is the same PL, but different peaks are observed when we dope the Jadeno, this is the electrochemical properties of same. And the here the band gap is also decreases as we increase the dopant percent. And this is the humidity sensing of the when the film is exposed to humidity, both chemisorptions and physiosorption process occur. During the chemisorption, a few water molecules are chemisorbed on activated side of surface to form hydroxyl group. After chemisorption, the first form surface will be changed further by exposure to humidity. Humidity means H2O content. Further water vapor are physically absorbed to form physiosorbs hydroxyl multi-layer. As water vapor continue to increase on the surface, extra layer are formed. Therefore, the physiosorption changes from monolayer to multilayer and conductivity increases. And we uh, observe the relative humidity versus impedance and, and at the different uh, frequencies. Frequencies are using 100 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, 1 megahertz, and 5 megahertz. In all samples, we see that as we increase the relative humidity, the impedance decreases. But the in higher frequency, the impedance decreases up to two order. This means the high frequency is favorable for uh, humidity sensing. And this is the uh, sensitivity uh, versus relative uh, humidity and sensitivity 
versus different weight percent here we see that the as we increases the jdno content we the sensitivity increase uh, zero to two increases very sharply after that slowly increases and this is the response and recovery uh, time of pure uh, jdno polyenilin and jdno two response time is the response the when we expose to one percent rh to ninety percent rh and we take the reading of rh ten percent rh sit uh, in and at ninety percent rh and we difference it we get the response time and when we ninety percent to ten percent reduce the immunity we get the response time here we see that the response and recovery type of pure polyenilin is uh, good for in comparison to dope film but in the case of jeno the response time is <coughs> better for 5% weighting of mno2 doping this is our uh, we are doing to geo doping of jeno and this is also our bi203 but this is the conclusion of xrd confirm the formation of semi crystalline form of polyenilin fsm reveals the granular structure of the sample which help in sensing cyclic voltammer of pani mono2 and uh, polyenilin geo so that as we increase the doping percentage specific capacitor increases and this property is used as in a super capacitor and in the case of polyenilin or mn2 impedance reduction high sensitivity and better response recovery time has also been observed which can be suitable for humidity sensing application and the band gap engineering these composite can be suitable for optical uh, application such as led thank you thank you prof uh, now our last uh, uh, speaker uh, of today's uh, last day of international webinar is Professor Imad Faud uh, will be discussing a scrutiny of leakage currents with insulating materials for transistor applications. He is currently professor in the Department of Natural Science, uh, Florida Polytechnic University. His uh, uh, PhD in theoretical and computational physics from Cairo University, Egypt. His research interest and expertise include quantum transport characteristics of energy efficient nano devices, electromagnetic properties of type 2 high temperature superconductors, emerging nano materials like graphene for electronic devices and other high K materials such as half minium oxide. Uh, he is also selected as IEEE International Midwest Symposium. Uh, reviewer for IEEE International Midwest Symposium on Circuits and Systems 2020. Uh, so now I request uh, Professor Imad Fahd to deliver his lecture. Dr. Fahd. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, greetings to everyone uh, in the conference, and especially I would like to express my uh, thanks to Professor Dr. Uh, Sisha Sernivasan, the head of the Natural Science Department, and uh, for Dr. K. Verma, the head of physics in uh, Dr. Mamar uh, University in India, and uh, thank you for giving me the chance uh, to do my presentation and the international webinar on material synthesis and characterization, uh, IWMSC 2020. So did you see my uh, presentation? Yes. Yeah. Can you go with the slide presentation? Sure. This, this way, sir? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So actually, uh, this is, uh, uh, we would like to treat uh, the technology of the achievement of the, the progress on manufacture of the new uh, devices and the chip. So this work, actually, we did it in Florida Polytechnic University with the cooperation of Dr. Muhammad Allah in the Electrical Engineering Department. And uh, this work, already we published it in uh, international journal and uh, in my talk i will talk about in this presentation i i would like to presentation outline background problem statement 
the specific goals and objectives uh, 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 summary and discussion and conclusions and the future research. Like uh, why we do this study for the uh, leakage current? What is the problem of the leakage current? What's uh, the uh, why we need to to like address this situation or this problem? Uh, mainly, if we have a little bit background about the the manufacture and the map, the Moore's map of the electronics and devices and how many chip, uh, uh, how many transistor for every microprocessor. Uh, this is actually, uh, if you go back a little bit, like 1950s, you will see they started with a vacuum tube and they go to the end. And after this, they go to bipolar junction transistor. And after bipolar junk trans junction transistor, we complete, uh, completely move to the console or complementary metal oxide semiconductor comes and the field effect transistor fit. So if you, if you see the, the, the tracking of the history for this manufacturing, Actually, right now we go to the the the, map, the astounding progress of electronics in the 20th century. Now, sometimes it's secure the dramatic story of repeated reinvention of underlying devices technologies. So the reinvention now get the like limits of power dissipation and self heating for the corresponding devices. So if I show you the more map, uh, how many devices uh, every uh, per, per micro uh, micro uh, chip, this is every year. Every, sorry, every double year, two years, the number of the, uh, the the transistor will be doubled and the price will be half. And this is what's happened now. This is actually up till 2020 map. So after this, when we go to very low scale, the integrated circuit industry uh, Moore's curve. After we go to this scale, now we go to the it's kind of the end of the map. This is give you the channel of the base to be decreasing. If you, if you see here on my y axis, the feature size, we decrease, decrease, decrease. So if we be closer to the channel size to get closer to 0.1 micrometer or 100 nanometers, you see the gate length now get uh, take another track. Why? Because actually, if the gate length closer to one nanometer length, 10 power negative nine meter, this will generate another problem, which will generate the leakage current. What is the leakage current? It came from the capacitance because for a very, very short length, for a very short uh, D, as we know that the capacitance will be get by a very higher value. And this will uh, increase the power dissipation. The, the leakage current will get power dissipation and this power dissipation will consume around 50% from the supplied voltage for the transistor. And if you count now, as you see from the previous map, we have like millions of millions of transistors for uh, every single uh, microchip. So if you count per each of them, it will consume half of the supplied voltage. This will consume a lot of power and the chip, and this will make heating. And so we have to treat this, or we have to work on this side for, uh, for the leakage current. So leakage current to take or consume like 50% from the total power consumption, the nanoscale, so in the nanoscale ERNA, the, this percentage will increase further. However, diagnosing of the interface quality and the interaction between insulators and semiconductor and significant is significant to reduce the leakage current. So how can we reduce the, the, the leakage current? Actually, the interface between the transistor right now, they use usually uh, silicon dioxide. But silicon dioxide, we in this paper, um, we, we compare this with another five new material they suggested to replace or to switch to silicon dioxide. So the silicon dioxide exhibits higher uh, capacitance or increase the, the, the power dissipation in the transistor. So we started, we, we arranging our uh, uh, dielectric factor or K from nine up to 25 and we consider in this research five materials. These five materials are the, uh, the titanium dioxide, aluminum oxide, and silicon uh, nitride, and zirconium dioxide, and uh, hafanium uh, dioxide. These five materials, we will compare them. We, will, we search for their physical properties, and we actually simulate their behaving uh, versus um, the thickness of the channel. We, we started from like three uh, nanometer, and we go down, 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 till maybe 0.5. Uh, nanometer for each of them, and we see we, we we watch the current how it look like, 
And actually, after this uh, work, we recommended the Havanium uh, dioxide is the best one for all of these five materials. Because actually, you you need to to select a material that to to decrease the leakage current, and at the same time, you will not increase the size because you have to increase. You have to to to, to still keeping the nano scale or the nano size. So you have to balance the material to give you this one and this one at the same time. Don't leave one on the, on the other hand of the other one. So the objective of this uh, work or this presentation, uh, we're collecting many various parameters for five insulating materials. Then we include a review summarizing the progress uh, and the development of treating the leakage current. What is the best way you can select? What is the best material you can select to use it as insulating material? And what is the, the uh, uh, characterization of this material? What do you need for this material? Which makes sense for all people who will work in this one. Uh, the leakage current basics actually, what does make it leakage current? Or, uh, absolutely high voltage produce uh, current in insulators. All insulators, by the way, even if they have resistance, but they have very, very uh, tiny current. This current, um, you can see it now, uh, it's kind of 10 power negative 24 or 10 power negative 10. It's very, very minor current, but overall, if you count how long you leave the transistor or the chip working, this is a kind of it's counting. Per time, it's count, it's sensitive, it's participation. Like if you, if you see now, we, we lose from the leakage current 50% from the power. So if you put in the other hand, if we save this 100%, it means your, uh, say, laptop battery, and instead of lasting with you six hours, it can be lasting for 12 hours because you don't, you don't have dissipation. Absolutely, ideally, we cannot get zero dissipation, but we're working to decrease it so far. With, with the current situation, we would like to decrease it. So the amount of the current depends on uh, applied voltage. This is absolutely according to Ohm's law and systems uh, parasitics capacitance, the capacitance of the system, which is the factor here, the channel, the size, which we decrease the length, but we go to the end of the map, uh, total resistance and temperature of the material. Uh, temperature of the material because if you increase the power dissipation, this will affecting and the temperature of the material or the chip will be changing. So from this, actually, by the, the way, the, the oxide capacitance, how is it vary with the, uh, with the size? This is how it varies with the oxide thickness. So if you pay attention here, we have from 0.5 nanometer on X axis up to 3 nanometers. If we consider it at 3 nanometers, at 3 nanometers, this is kind of uh, all of them have the same oxide capacitance. So if you use any one of those, uh, the five materials that we're comparing, they will be almost almost closer, very close. Like you, you're talking about 0.2 uh, farad per nanometer square. So they are very close. But if, you, if you're thinking about to go very low thickness, we, we, we move to nano. Very, if we call about one nano, this one nano will be, you, you see the variety between them, all of them, all the five. So the best one of them have anion dioxide, which is the middle one. The, this one, it's recommended to the better one of them because we need to, to keep uh, the capacitance at certain level and the dimension at the same level. So the best way for K, the electric constant, to be actually between 25 and 30. We convert here, by the way, from 12 up to 25, these five materials. But the best recommendation, the best fit for K, the electric constant, to be uh, between 25, uh, 25 uh, and 30. So uh, this is, by the way, the general uh, dioxide capacitance of different insulating materials. So right now, we would like to see uh, every one of those, we would like to treat it in different way. How can we get the characterization of each one of those? And what the sources of the leakage current on the chip? What, what produces the leakage current? We treat it in, by the way, in, in three different uh, three different situations: the sub three short current and the gate uh, oxide and the band to band or BTBT tunneling current. So we suggested the module uh, of this, and before we suggest the module, we collect all the physical parameters of these five uh, materials: uh, titanium dioxide, aluminum oxide, silicon nitride, zirconium dioxide, and havanium. Uh, dioxide. So actually, the very important thing for this one, we we we're talking about the electric constant. This is a very important one. 
for uh, the the factor or this is the one. The other parameters we just put it in, uh, we collected it to, to help us for the physical dimensions uh, for the filler of the insulating material, but we mainly work in the dielectric constant for those. And uh, the Havanium is 25, which is located in the best fit range between 25 and 30. And this is a module, by the way, uh, we suggested or we designed uh, to calculate the leakage current. So uh, source and the gate and drain. So right now we see three different leakage current, gate leakage, sub three short leakage, and the reverse bias junction, BTBT. So between each one of those, if you have region like uh, P type or N type, it depends on the dopant uh, material and the concentration in of the dopant material in the semiconductor and the interface between the junction and the other junction. So we will start with the sub three shot uh, leakage current and the sub three shot leakage current actually, this is the one was dotted, this is the, this is the sub three shot, it's between, it's, it's kind of from source to gate and the gate to drain. And you have gate leakage and this gate leakage, if we see it, it's three of them, because gate leakage will, de will be dependent on three factors, uh, like electron conduction band, uh, uh, <laughs> hole, uh, valence band. Uh, is there any question? Any question for me? Okay. Then uh, the reverse bias junction, BT, BT, which is this arrow uh, uh, background wide. So the first one, the, the, sub, uh, the sub three shot current, the first one is dominated by the diffusion current and it depends exponentially. As you see, this is power E power, exponentially on the gate to source and the three shot voltage. The sub three shot uh, leakage current for the MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor device can be, can, we, we, we suggested we use this equation uh, where I zero is W, W is the width, of uh, the, the the chip you have it W mu naught uh, C uh, O X V T squared e power 1.8 over L. So mainly actually uh, depending on the dimension like the width of this one and the length. So W and L is the length width and the length. So the dimension of the chip or the transistor is very very important factor for how much power will be dissipated depending on the length of the channel. So the sub three shot current in this case, this is actually uh, we 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 uh, we consider it the first one because if we see it in the y axis here, this is ten power negative ten. This is the main one or the major one, by the way. Even if it's angstrom uh, amps, but it is it's considerable on the on the level of you have uh, hundreds of thousands or trillions of uh, transistor and the micro chip. This will be counted. So with the same scale of the x-axis of the length, starting like from 0.5 uh, nanometer thickness up to three nanometers thickness. So you, you, you talk about uh, the current ranging from 0.5 uh, angstrom amps up to 5.8 approximately angstrom amps. So, and this is, this is the first one, which is the sub three shot current. The sub three shot current, usually it's, it's countable or considerable when the gate voltage less than the V3 shot, like if you decrease the voltage, absolutely we will we will we work for to fit lower voltage. If you fit lower voltage, this means your battery will lasting for a long time. So if your V gate less than V3 shot, this will appear. This will 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 take count. And this is the, this 10 power negative 10. This is countable, or this is uh, the one of the biggest one. The second one is the gate. Uh, oxide tunneling current and the gate oxide tunneling current a gate it's also if we see here where a at the effective transistor width and length also we usually consider the dimension of the transistor so w and a and it is the same scenario it is exponentially decay and this, we consider also the same scale on the x-axis we started from 0.5 till 3 uh, nanometer uh, length and this is, in this case, uh, this is 10 power negative 24. So 10 power negative 24, by the way, it is very, very low comparing with uh, the sub three shot current. It was 10 power negative 10. But this is also, it is countable, the second factor for those. 
for these two uh, effects of the insulating material and the leakage current, both of them actually, we're still considering the Havanium or the, uh, the Havanium dioxide is the best uh, insulating material uh, to use it in, in this case. So uh, the third one, by the way, was band to band. Um, uh, but before I, I leave this one, I would like to mention that the, through the, the oxide potentially have electron uh, conduction band and the electron valence band and whole valence band. When this electron jumping from valence band or conduction band or the whole move, this is the way it will leak and it will generate like kind of uh, tiny current, which we call it the leakage current. And this is dissipation of the energy or the from the supplied power to the transistor. The effect on, on the third one, it's band to band tunneling. And the band to band tunneling actually it's depending on, do you, ha you have in every single transistor, we have two junctions. Like if it's transistor PNP or NPN, so you have two junctions. So the, 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 the current or the leakage current is a function of the doping concentration, it depends on. And also we consider the length and the width of this one. So in this case, it's kind of in between the sub three shot current and the gate dioxide current. So it is not like high, like the sub three shot current, it's not 10 power negative 10, and it's not very low, like 10 power negative 24. So this one is count to be 10 power negative 14. So, but this is also count, and we still fix it, uh, the x-axis uh, dimension or the length of the channel to be between 0.5 up to 3 nanometer. So all of this current, if we add the whole three uh, type or the whole three sources for the leakage current, this will give you like considerable value of the leakage current, dissipation of the power for the, from the power you fit for the transistor. So in this case, if we collect all of the whole three, the whole three uh, parameters or the whole three factors that are affecting or generating the leakage current, which is the major one of them, by the way, is the sub three shot current. So I'm sure that if we add all of this, you will just go to 10 power negative 10, other one will not be. So this is a total leakage current for the whole three factors. And now we, we consider like the first one is the major one or the dominant one uh, for the whole three leakage current with the same exact length. So depending on this simulation or on this calculation prediction for these three, uh, for these five different material, we recommend the Havanium dioxide uh, to be used in, instead of the silicon dioxide, which will be being used for a long time uh, in the transistor as an insulating material, so it will decrease the leakage current and it will keep the factor of the dielectric constant at the same time. So uh, this is actually, uh, this was the treatment, the theoretical treatment for the transistor dimension, uh, what, whatever, whatever the best material, you can use it as an insulating material. Oh, every single material, every insulating material, even if it's insulating, it still has resistance. And the whatever resistance, it is not like 100% open. It's not like infinity. It has some leakage current, and this leakage current dissipated your power or waste your power. And if you consider it as 50%, this is big percentage. So we recommend that the Havanium dioxide is the best uh, uh, insulating material and instead of the uh, uh, silicon dioxide. So depending on this uh, uh, module and the, the curve and the, the, the prediction, I would like to summarize and discuss this work. So the scaling of the device dimension has historically made advances in the silicon, uh, ULSI technology, how to make it. As a result of this scaling, both the vertical and the horizontal dimension have been reduced to a point where the silicon dioxide as a dielectric material cannot satisfy the requirements. So we go now to the end of the slower scaling. So what's the next step? The many benefits driving manufacturers to use low K, the electric material, include increased device speed, reduced power, required heat dissipation. So depending on this, uh, we, we predict or we would like to work in the future for the research at the vertical scaling requirement for the gate stack and for shallow extension junction required one nanometer for the channel. This is depending on Morse and the prediction of the uh, equivalent oxide thickness, EOT. To deal with leakage current tunneling, some metal oxide like uh, avanium dioxide and zirconium dioxide and their silicates have been identified as promising material that are support, supposed to work with one nanometer 
uh, equivalent oxide thickness. Over integration of high K, we, but we have to manage it between this one and the other one. In spite of the advantages of the silicon gate, the present process uh, follow uh, to integrate the future advanced gate spec employing these high K materials is still questionable. Like the, it is not like finalized testable yet. This is kind of theoretical treatment. And thus, a new integration schemes and device structures may be required to form source drain junctions of metal oxide semiconductor, and all high temperature processes are to be done before the formation of the gate step. This is uh, actually, uh, this is a future advice that this material is suggested theoretically, but how the uh, industry can uh, like predict them or uh, test them for higher scale, or do we able to apply them experimentally? And if we test them experimentally, are they going to verify the requirement and they will get a good job for saving the time and the scale at the same time? Because the scale, no more you go lower than one nano due to the this thing is because if you would like to, list, to fit this voltage, it means you have to make sure that you will not waste, waste sorry, most of it. So this actually was uh, my talk. And I'm sure I'm, I'm ready. Yes, Professor Ford. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have a query from one of our participants. Uh, this is about I want to know the behavior of graphene oxide on integrated capacitor in terms of capacitance. Does it work as insulating material? Graphene oxide? Yes. Uh, Dr. Sasha, this is a very good question, but uh, in this one, actually, we do not consider the graphene co uh, oxide, but I think this maybe we can, uh, like, we can study this, or I can search for uh, if anyone, like, studied before or not. But when, in this study, we did this five material that I just mentioned, uh, like titanium, but uh, is, is, is it graphene? It's, it's considered kind of uh, conducting. Thank you, yeah. It's yeah, more conducting. So, there is no way, I think, to use graphene as, as a conducting material. We talk about the insulating material that yeah. uses between, like, drain and uh, source and the uh, gate. Uh, sorry, source and the gate and the gate and the drain. So this is the thing we would like to use uh, insulating material. But if you use graphene conducting, okay. I don't think okay. it will work. All right. Yes, sir. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Arma? Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Ford, for a very nice lecture. And I sincerely hope that all the partici participants must be benefited from your lecture. And uh, all the queries put by the participants will be uh, solved by our panelist. And uh, Dr. Sesa will send it uh, to all to the concerned participants by email uh, before the concluding ceremony uh, dr anil kumar will tell uh, about the department uh, initiative in this pandemic and about the uh, international webinar thereafter dr sesa srinivasan uh, sri sai raman will uh, give you the glimpse of international webinar and thereafter con concluding ceremony will be uh, dr anil kumar thank you sir good morning to all participants from usa and good evening to all participants from south india and india this mount mind blowing international work webinar lighted our knowledge in the versatile field of material science different types of experimental techniques, research methodology, and application of the materials in various fields. And this is possible only due to the great effort of Professor K.K. Verma, sir, our head of the department and convener of the international webinar, and Professor Sesa Srinivasan, who is a Polytechnic University of Florida, USA, the co-convener of the webinar. In the leadership of Professor Verma, sir, our department has organized 14 web lectures in this pandemic and launched departmental YouTube channel. I hope that this international webinar was very informative and provide a platform to 
young researchers for their future research in the field of material science. On behalf of organizing committee, we are highly thankful to all distinguished speakers and attendees. I extended my special thanks to my ATV Professor T.K. Barmasar, Professor Sesha Srinivasan, and my mentor, Professor Ravindar, and all members of the organizing committee. Dr. Oh, before uh, Dr. Sesa Sai Raman, I welcome Dr. Mary Volaro from oh, uh, your oh. university. Yeah. And uh, very good uh, uh, evening from India. And Dr. Sesa, please carry on. Okay. Uh, let me see. Before I go, I would like to ask uh, our organizing secretary, Dr. Ajit Kumshik, to say a few words from our side. Okay. Um, no, Mary, can you wait for a minute? Yes, no problem. Yeah. Ajit, can you please uh, wrap up from your side? From our side? Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you so much. Uh, at the same note, like Professor Verma, I'm, I'm really uh, happy, and uh, this is really a very informative conference and uh, entertaining too, especially in the time of pandemic, which is really appreciated. The the talks uh, based on material science and their state of the art applications, and how how can we use various characterization techniques and different modifications in a single materials for various applications is the main focus of this conference, which is really appreciated. And I'm sure this is going to help us to change some strategies in our training and skill development. And I'm sure both sides will be very much uh, benefited with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ajit Kosik. Thank you. Just a second. Um, oh. Hello. Ah, yes. Uh, before Dr. Valero, our chief guest of uh, this morning, evening, afternoon, whatever you can say. <laughs> uh, I would like to I would like to introduce our chief guest, uh, Professor. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. I'm just okay. Uh, hope you see this slide. I would like to introduce our speaker of um, uh, today, the closing ceremony, Professor Mary Villaro, of our um, very friendly, very beloved uh, faculty from Mechanical Engineering, Chair of the Department. Dr. Mary Villaro joined the faculty of Florida Polytechnic in the fall of 2016, and is a Chair of the Mechanical Engineering, of course, Interim Chair of uh, Environmental Engineering, we, we, we created recently and an associate professor of uh, mechanical engineering with a bachelor of science in mechanical engineering degree. And she is the person behind of all our curriculum in mechanical engineering. She put uh, all the time and effort and making the very, very precise, compact, uh, whatever you call it, the curriculum for mechanical engineering, which is accredited by ABET, that is one of the international body of ABET accreditation for our me mechanical engineering program. Uh, she led the program and she is the coordinator for the um, materials characterization. Lab. She is a lab uh, coordinator and in charge. She collaborated with the colleagues at Florida Polytechnic and around the nation to support our materials characterization lab. We have, in fact, a million dollars of uh, characterization tools featuring about Hitachi SCM, the modern one, that is SU3500, uh, which has got um, all kind of vacuum, non-vacuum systems, and the Rigaku Smart Lab X-ray diffractometer with a bunch of other X-rays, because our undergraduate students, even trained in nanotechnology courses, they use the instrumentation. Dr. Valero received a PhD at the University of Connecticut for Master's in Regulus Polytechnic University and her BSME at Western New England University. She has held entity positions if someone is making noise. 
No. Can you uh, ta stop typing, somebody? Don't type here. So uh, she has held engineering positions in industry, in particular the material science area, and holds one patent. Her PhD research focused on electron beam evaporation of nickel chromium thin films, which were characterized using TEM to determine the phases present over a range of compositions and temperatures. Also, she, is, she was involved with engineering education. She got so many books on engineering education. She was a chair of the ASEE. Those who don't know ASEE, it's the American uh, Engineering Education, Society for Engineering Education. She was a chair of the ASEE Materials Division and continues to be active in that ASEE division. She has written in the areas of material science education, leadership, and teaming activities for engineers, of course, physicists, chemists, uh, and now is active with the ASME, that is American Society for Mechanical Engineers, and their Mechanical Engineering Chair Group and Conference. With that, I will also tell that she is, a, uh, what do you call, um, she is our, main person for this COVID-19 recovery plan. She was working with uh, Professor Kaushik and the administration to make that uh, we can use the campus in fall semester. With that, I would like to introduce, uh, invite Dr. Mary Valaro for giving you a closing notes. Good morning, evening, afternoon to everyone. And stop that, <laughs> that my mic was open. Oh. Um, you all know I have a dog in the background. I think he's quiet now. Um, but thank you for this opportunity, and thank you to my colleagues for hosting this virtual seminar. Um, it's amazing how how far we've come since March uh, to a complete panic to having a worldwide webinar, all of us sitting there with our, our unique backgrounds, um, in technical areas and physically in our homes, um, collaborating and continuing our work. So, um, Dr. Srinivasan, thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you for um, hosting this at Poly and bringing all these folks together. Um, yes, as he mentioned, we do have a world class um, characterization facility, nearly a million, million and a half dollars worth of beautiful equipment so as you're doing your characterization think of us um, as we're, we're uh, maturing in the university uh, there are more and more opportunities our students I think are getting smarter and smarter and more hands-on so there's a great experience with that so my closing comments are kind of to wrap up your activities for uh, this conference and noting that um, Materials characterization is truly interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and it brings together people from all different uh, areas, physics, chemistry, engineering, uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, <laughs> material science, and that really, really allows the community to share um, ideas, uh, research, innovative ways to look at these new materials. Um, through, as a material scientist, uh, by PhD myself, processing properties, microstructure, any way you want to kind of sort that with synthesis, characterization, measurement. Uh, but bottom line is we're really all working with these instruments, this characterization, to discover new things and add to our knowledge base uh, that moves along. We think many years back and there was a debate, should we use silicon for uh, semiconductors or some of the more exotic metals? I guess we're pretty good that we picked silicon at this point and now we're refining, refining from there. So really we have these, this um, characterization techniques that tie us all together. Um, and with these overarching themes that are truly contributing to society in energy storage, um, from uh, um, ma uh, electronics, ma and from macro scales, 
to nanoscale, from optical microscopy to SEM to TEM, looking at new ways to see finer and finer detail at a smaller and smaller scale. Um, so I think that really, really does help with that wide range of applications. And again, that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary idea to share this information. So topics, I, I took a look at the program and, and really it touches on the, uh, the breadth of things from, again, energy, healthcare, uh, artificial intelligence, electronics, microprocessors, all your work will have just that little bit of contribution to move those. Hello, Dr. Valero. Our link is down. Oh, okay, she's not. Dr. Valero? Uh, this yeah. is a way to be able to, to uh, find some useful and uh, quite uh, exotic uh, combinations. And that might be exotic today and commonplace um, uh, tomorrow, so to speak. So I think just to wrap up and, and congratulate you all on your work um, and, and again, sharing this through this worldwide virtual conference um, and actually figuring out what time it is and what what region of the world. <laughs> I yeah. think I checked with Dr. Srinivasan about four times. It's 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. and uh, um, to be able to join you and speak for the poly community. Um, and thank you all for your uh, participation. And again, um, to, to our organizers to uh, host this. And, and share everything and bring to truly bring together what Polytechnic is and our STEM university, sharing fields in physics, chemistry, material science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, uh, and, and uh, bringing us all together. So thank you so thank much you. for your participation. And I'm glad I could kind of close this and, and congratulate you all. Thank you. And I would like to, yeah, before I would like to, uh, Professor Verma to take over, I would like to show a few slides about the wrap up of a glimpse of IWMSC 2020. So let me share my screen. Um, and then I'm going to, I have so many things going on. Uh, <laughs> One. Okay, what you see is here. Uh, this is um, IWMSC 2020 glimpse, what we went through all three days, uh, three days, three hours, whatever. Uh, Professor K.K. Verma was very consistent, very directive, very, very professional for dealing all this, how to handle from the day one when you are started planning. Of course, it all started with the, when I was giving a lecture to him for one day, then he, we started talking and then we were coming with the plan. And I said, we have a Florida Poly has a thousand attendees we can attend at one time. Do you believe that? So we have that kind of uh, experience. So it all happened. Uh, I would like to put my perspective in terms of uh, different uh, uh, plans in these slides. The first thing is the material science and characterization. Actually, it was like a three days we got a tutorial. The characterization tutorial by Professor Anjal Srivastava from Banaras, Hindu University. It's amazing. Eye tree electron microscope. So all the way from your human eye, he was talking about all the inventors, all the discoverers, electron microscopy, scanning molecular electron, and then what we are today. We are in the high-end tools with the artificial intelligence and data analytics. Thank you, Sanchal Sivaswa. Then Professor Rajesh Kumar from Indian Institute of uh, Technology, Indoor. It's a very new campus. He was talking about Raman scattering to spectroscopy to microscopy. That means it's a it's total spectrum. It's a, it's a, you're taking from a one dimension to almost four or five dimensions about to how to look at samples for different applications, in fact, the electrochromic applications, 
and many other things. So his micro Raman facility is available for us to use for the participants and panelists. And Professor Ravindra Da today was just amazing to give an overview of how to how not to miss a peak, which is not a peak you can see in the differential scanning calorimetry. That means you will easily bypass the peak, but you have to nail it down and then find that what is that peak is meant for. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, uh, vast uh, uh, energy and vast knowledge to share your uh, uh, characterization. So this is about characterization as a tutorial. The next slide is about material synthesis for different applications. So I started the first day with uh, starting with the complex hydrates and chemical hydrates for hydrogen energy storage. Uh, Professor Binay Kumar Gupta, Binay Kumar and Dr. Manoj Gupta, Professor Binay Kumar from Delhi, India, Manoj Kumar from Ampri, um, they are Bhopal. They were talking about the piezoelectric from all the way from the crystals by the Shekralsky process to grow the crystals all the way to nanostructures for energy harvesting in nano energy generators. That was very intriguing and what uh, Dr. Manoj Gupta showed that all kind of uh, tire pressure makes that the energy of a few volts, a few micro volts to volts, that's amazing. Thank you very much for Dr. Binay Kumar and Dr. Manoj Gupta. Professor R.K. Shutra today, uh, the first day, uh, uh, today he was, uh, and Dr. Shobna Chaudhary were talking about the polymer nanomaterials, nanostructures with the doping and undoping for even uh, electrochromic or you name it, what are the application, the polymer is good for that. So they have done a wide, even like uh, Dr. Shukla and Chaudhary were talking about from the basic principles of uh, polymers with the different types of polymers and working on the, how to functionalize the polymers. That's amazing. Uh, the, the thing uh, on the first day, we also had a very illuminating talk from Professor Aditya Mahate from uh, Rice University, Texas. He was talking about the Hanai Prevoscites for solar PV energy harvesting applications. Dr. Raditya Mahate, if you are not here, thank you so much for joining us and giving you a very important uh, field of research. The next material synthesis and the application, Professor Anchar Srivastava and his students, of course, now they are postdoc, one in uh, South Korea and one in um, uh, Sweden, uh, Uppsala University. Professor Anchar Srivastava and his uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar Singh, Dr. Himanshu Mishra and of course, uh, Professor Varsha Kare were talking about 0D, 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D, or maybe we may 10D sometimes. So nanostructure, they were talking from basic of uh, graphene, graphene oxide, tungsten oxide, tungsten sulfide, molybdenum sulfide, and 4D structure, Dr. Varsha Kare was talking about the uh, 3D printing and 4D printing for uh, wonderful applications in uh, diagnostics as well as uh, the biological applications. Professor Ravindra Dagadhar again, as Dr. Verma said, he is the father of liquid crystals in India. So uh, again, I know one theoretical professor from Banaras, uh, Professor Yeshwan Singh. Yeshwan Singh is a theoretical father of uh, liquid crystals. Uh, I'm very amazing to see the liquid crystals having so many apply versatile applications. Then I come back to Rajesh Kumar and Dr. R.K. Shukla. They were talking about flexible nanomaterials for electrochromic applications, which is Ajit and I, we are working with the USF, University of South Florida here. We wanted to send you some samples, sir, for the electrochromic device or probably Raman uh, spectroscopy. Uh, the next one is uh, myself. Uh, and uh, other people, they were talking about the hybrid materials and oxides for wastewater remediation project, which we are currently funded. Then I just pushed into a different uh, dimension about 21st century material discovery. Professor Vashakari and Dr. Ajit Kaushik were talking um, the, the, the need of the hour. The need of the hour is your AI, AI and IOTs. Uh, for 3D printing and 4D printing, data science, data analytics, and big data. Um, these are the ones which will be taking over all the material science or all over the fields. 
Uh, in fact, I would like to say that our Florida Polytechnic, you imagine, the, imagine that we do have a supercomputer, uh, which is unheard of in the university. Normally, it will be in the Department of Energy or National Labs. And then we also 50 3D printing machines to, within our campus to make that all the student projects available for that. So thank you, Professor Kare and uh, um, Professor Kare's husband. Thank you, sir, for you also working with the Professor Kare to making all these wonderful things in uh, your research from South Korea. And Professor Ajit Kaushik is wonderful all the time. I, I can't say more than that. Computational material research, ABN issue, uh, density functional theory and theoretical validation, that's very demanded, very needed for the hour for even experimentalists. Professor Vashakri again touch upon the ABN issue calculations uh, and all the artificial computational theory. Professor Imadal Fawad, uh, uh, who talk about the theoretical validation of the transistor electronics. I guess that's my last slide. So with that, I stop my presentation. That's the overview of what we went through for three days. That, that's a fully packed and fully enriching experience. Now it's motivated. It's, I'm really motivated to do some. And I, I would like to say Professor Verma, because he is a backbone. She's the, uh, she is a great researcher. She has worked on the high TC superconductors, including mercury based superconductors, for a long time. So, probably next time we will have Professor Verma as an uh, invite for uh, our Florida Poly for giving a talk. With that, I will give it to Professor Verma to conclude. Thank you, Dr. Sesar Sai Raman, for this wonderful uh, overview of this international webinar which is jointly organized by our department, uh, Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia Abad University and Florida Polytechnic University, Florida, USA. Uh, you have wonderfully explained uh, each and every speaker's uh, contribution to this seminar with, with very classification uh, title. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, one thing I want to share this, Dr. Ajit Kausik uh, has become very popular in uh, in this place. Everybody is demanding his lecture slides for newspapers, uh, for news. <laughs> I will send you the news <laughs> clippings. Uh, I am indeed thankful to Dr. Professor Mary Valero for giving such an inspiring talk and we are really energized by his talk. And this prompted us to organize some other event in joint collaboration with Florida Polytechnic University. Thank you, madam, for coming over here and giving the inspi inspirational talk to us. And I am indeed thankful to uh, our panelist, uh, uh, my friend, Dr. Vinay Kumar, uh, uh, Dr. Anchal Srivastava, Dr. Ajit Kausik, Imad Ford, Dr. Ravindradhar, and all other panelists who is not here. And at the last, I want to thank my organizing secretary, uh, Dr. Anil Kumar and our organizing team, particularly Engineer Nidhi Asthana for doing some all computational work of feedback form and other things uh, she has done beautifully. So again, I want to thank all of you for your nice cooperation and I hope, sincerely hope that we will be getting your this nice cooperation in future too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we can uh, close. Anybody off. wants to say something from panelists? Yeah, any of our panelists? Yeah. Who wants to say? I will open your microphone. Anchal, would you want to say something? Yeah, Professor Anchal, please. You are unmuted. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to uh, see our seniors and interact all the people who are 
working uh, and after a very long time we are in touch with all these people and this uh, given real opportunity and platform for meeting all this uh, wonderful uh, bunch of scientists uh, thank you very much florida thank you very much uh, kk verma ji fazabad uh, awad university this all is amazing this 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 is very very uh, illuminating and uh, i met a lot of people like kaushik varsha khare vijay and dhar sukla sir many many people and thank you very much to all and thank you very much okay. uh, let me open for dr vinay kumar sir take 2 minutes everyone dr vinay ji yes yes uh, just yes, to sir. say very uh, really thank you all uh, particularly uh, kiran uh, you are definitely amazing i have seen every time you are speaking to the camera uh, and organizing all those things uh, professor uh, shesha you are uh, more than amazing i must say that you started from the first talk and you ended up with a very good wind up of all the summary of the all presentations um uh, uh, in last few months i have been uh, attending or participating in many lectures of this type of seminar but i find uh, this one of the most well organized uh, event and i will remember it for long thank you thank you all i have been seeing so many good lectures and i have seen your uh, downloaded uh, recording also uh, thank you so it is uh, very nice for all the participants thank you thank, thank you sir thank you sir uh, now professor for okay uh, it's actually it was very uh, successful uh, conference um, it actually take a lot of effort from dr sirnivas and dr uh, verma uh, i would like to to appreciate all your work and uh, i appreciate your uh, hard working for the last like two months to arrange this over all the world uh, thank you everyone for the attendee we we, we targeted like more than 160 attendee participants uh, sometimes and we do not uh, this is very very like um, it's more than if it's in campus by the way so this thank you everyone Thank you, Dr. Sanjeevasan. Thank you, Dr. Kashuk. Thank you, Dr. Verma. Thank you all uh, from India. Your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, Professor Rajesh Shukla. Sir, Professor Rajesh Shukla, not here. I don't see the microphone. Uh, well, I have very, um, very close colleague, and uh, he is a great inspiration for my research. Uh, Dr. Scott Wallen joined here. Uh, Dr. Scott Wallen, who is our um, the very good researcher, staff member of Florida Polytechnic. Dr. Scott Wallen, can you come again? Just a few words, if you want. I just want to say that today was the first day that I was able to attend, but um, it was really an impressive uh, group of talks from the people. And um, I think it's something that um, should be done more often. I think it was a really great conference uh, put together by Dr. Sesha and Dr. Uh, Varma um, and all the others. Yes, Dr. Wallen is uh, an analytical chemist by himself and uh, he does um, all the time characterization for the materials, different materials. So he's a great chemist and a great analytical wow. and physical chemist. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wallen. And now I would like to invite Dr. Varsha Kare to share her um, uh, views. Professor yeah, Kare. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very, very much, um, Dr. Verma and uh, Sairaman. Yes, um, you are as active as you were at that time, as, uh, as uh, systematic as you were at that time. And Verma ji, you are you're always the inspiration for us uh, to work quietly and uh, nicely. It was really nice to um, to be the part of this um, this um, webinar. Um, I'm really really uh, pleased to um, see all of you and uh, such a wonderful meeting. I never thought that uh, uh, it could be so so interesting. Um, thank you very much, you all. And if you guys are uh, interesting uh, in any of this kind of work, you're most welcome. Um, I will be happy to uh, discuss with you for further possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Okay. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah. If um, yeah, I will stay a bit long, but you guys can take off. Um, thank you all, and we will see in next occasion. Probably the thank you occasion. Thank you, sir. Okay, now you people leave and go and have a cup of tea. Link to Ustin, I be far at the Google may Yaham de the day. अच्छा हम्म जो लिंक जो है गूगल फॉर्म का यहां दिए थे हम कहां पे चैट बॉक्स में अच्छा नहीं तो इट इज फॉर एवरीबॉडी देन यू गिव पोस्ट इट टू व्हाट्सएप हां वही करेंगे कर अभी कर देंगे Shukla ji, Shukla ji is still here. Dr. Shukla, it was very nice talk. I have to review your talk and I will have to get back. Shukla ji, where are you? Hello, hi, Anchal. The main architect behind this. <laughs> Dr. Sesa, he provided three yeah. speakers in five minutes. Achha. Don't worry, amazing, yeah. Aditya, Aditya Mahathiri, our research. Aditya is a very good uh, person, Sai. Very okay. nice human being. Okay, I will I'll definitely in touch. Yeah. Uh, we, we will be in touch. K.K. Verma sir, so... The distance so, of Rice University from Florida? Hmm. How much, okay. how far it is? Oh, it is in the central region, so probably uh, it's a central zone, so one hour behind they are. Okay. Uh, but uh, by flight, it's two hours, not two hours. Flight, it's two hours. Huh? Flight, it's two hours. Flight, it's two hours. Two hours, it's two hours. ये ऊपर है थोड़ा फ्लोरिडा नीचे है फ्लोरिडा साउथ में है भाई अंचल ने पूरा जो है पार्टिसिपेट किया सेसा हां यार दैट्स अ बिग शॉट आई एम गिविंग सो मच टाइम या आई हम लोगों के लिए लोग तो है ही है <laughs> अरे आप लोगों का आप ही लोगों का बंदा है तो क्यों नहीं देगा कितना डॉक्टर साहब कितना पीएचडी अभी तक खत्म किए हैं मैं हां कितना पीएचडी स्टूडेंट्स को बनाए हैं आप गिनता गिनना पड़ेगा सात आठ हो गए होंगे सर दस दस हो गए होंगे छोड़ दीजिए हम लोगों को आठ रजिस्टर्ड है सर एट आर रजिस्टर्ड यूएस में यू यूएस में इतना नहीं होता डॉक्टर साहब यहां तो बहुत मुश्किल है आप लोगों को मैनेज करना पड़ता है ना सर ग्रांट ग्रांट मैनेज करना पड़ता है ग्रांट नहीं है उनके पास वो इंडिया का सबसे बड़ा फायदा है स्टूडेंट कम विद देयर ओन फेलोशिप बहुत बढ़िया हम्म वो नहीं है हम लोगों के पास नहीं यहां आप अंडर ग्रेजुएट स्टूडेंट को काम करने के बोलेंगे तो दे हैव टू पे दे दे हैव टू गेट पेड सो यू हैव टू पे देम Dr. Sesa has worked in tirelessly throughout the three days and you can say week before that. That's a recording. Okay, okay, okay. Yet, energy ka kamal hai. Sesa saab energy pe kaam.